what do I want to know in this research? I want to know what Bluetooth chip is inside any given device. So you can have all of these various devices, but the question is, which chips are inside of them? Now I happen to know that Texas Instruments is used in Teslas, Broadcoms, and iPhones, Silicon Labs, and Nest cameras, but if I have any random device, how do I know what kind of Bluetooth chip is in there? Well, you say, why would you want to know that? Well, why I want to know it is because I want to know if that particular device is vulnerable to a firmware level exploit. So Armis led the way previously with the bleeding bit vulnerability where they could send a packet and compromise the firmware of Texas Instruments. My wife, Veronica Kova, also found vulnerabilities on Texas Instruments firmware that could be exploited without authentication over the air. Researchers in Simu Lab at the Technical University of Darmstadt in Germany had found vulnerabilities in Broadcom firmware, and my wife also found vulnerabilities in Silicon Labs firmware. So the point is, for all these types of exploits, there are always pre-authentication vulnerabilities where just by being in Bluetooth range, you could break in and compromise the firmware, and subsequently, depending on the architecture of the chip, maybe that gives you everything you need, or maybe you can then pivot and take over the application processor. So these vulnerabilities are super interesting, but the problem is no one knows where all they apply. Nobody knows where the Broadcoms all are, Silicon Labs, or Texas Instruments. So how am I going to figure this out? Well, in great Socrates fashion, the first thing is to know that I know nothing. Second thing is to collect a bunch of Bluetooth data, just naively, just collect whatever's out there and see if that helps tell me anything. And a third, find out what I don't know. So here's the delicious takeaways from this talk, and I'm going to return to them throughout the talk because they bear repeating. First thing is that Bluetooth sniffing goals are different from Wi-Fi goals. And so there's a good two decades now of Wi-Fi sniffing under people's belts, but there is not anywhere near as much attention paid to Bluetooth sniffing. But the thing that really motivated me to start with is the fact that when there are Bluetooth firmware bugs that are wireless over the air exploitable, no one actually knows what all it affects. So for instance, with my wife Veronica's Black Hat 2020 talk about her Bluetooth vulnerabilities, we didn't make a big deal out of this on purpose because we don't know what all it affects and we're not going to act like it's a big hairy deal when we don't actually know it is. The other thing is that there's a lot of devices out there that do not have human readable names and it is very much not clear what they are. Now that means that somebody, for instance me, ought to start learning how to tooth print Bluetooth devices and that'll be some future work for me. But even for those devices that do have advertised names, it's oftentimes very not clear what they are. And I'm looking at you, BLE003U. So first, let's talk about the differences in the goals of Bluetooth monitoring, sniffing versus Wi-Fi. Historically, Wi-Fi was mostly about things like finding open networks to have free internet access, finding unexpected entry points into corporate networks, or for instance, researching the distribution of increasingly secure protocols. So started out with web, which was always breakable, and then moving into more secure things. Now, I assert that Bluetooth monitoring is fundamentally different from Wi-Fi. Now, in the case of Bluetooth, I would say that the type of things we should be trying to determine are, for instance, whether a given device is static or mobile. So if you scan it multiple times, is it always in the same location or is it going to be moving around with someone like a watch, fitness tracker, a car? And that can, of course, be achieved by multiple scans over time. And so this research helps with that a little bit. And then there's also understanding the potential for individuals to be tracked by their Bluetooth devices. So this research helps with that and shows some examples of that. And you'll see this happy little tracking private eye whenever something has to do with trackability. And the next thing and what really motivated this was, I think it should be possible to have the information to know whether Bluetooth device is running vulnerable firmware. This talk only addresses that partially, but I will have additional upcoming research in the future that will address that more thoroughly. And the thing is here, Wi-Fi can totally adopt some of these same goals. For instance, knowing whether a Wi-Fi access point is running a vulnerable firmware. That's important because of work like this, the broad pwn vulnerability back in 2017. And that's kind of what actually got me interested in these Bluetooth firmware vulnerabilities uh, because they found pre-authentication packets you could just send to Broadcom-based uh, Wi-Fi devices and exploit the device over the air. But unfortunately, today's Wi-Fi sniffing and stumbling doesn't actually get us the information that we need to know whether any given device is vulnerable to these type of exploits or any future exploits that come out. When some new exploit comes out in an Intel chipset Wi-Fi, no one's going to actually know how many devices there are out there that are vulnerable. Uh, you know, even Intel probably won't really know. 
And then of course it would be good to know for Wi-Fi whether or not a device is static or mobile because actually we are starting to see more mobile Wi-Fi things. You have mobile Wi-Fi hotspots that connect to cellular networks and the equivalent things that are often found in cars. So when I was starting this research, I asked myself, you know, what hardware should I use to scan for Bluetooth? And of course, the only way to answer that is to make a spreadsheet. Because as Weird Al said, they call me the king of the spreadsheets. Got them all printed out of my bedsheets. My new computer's got the clocks it rocks, but it was obsolete before I opened the box. So the kind of things that I was looking at in the spreadsheet is, you know, what's the name of the board? Does it have an antenna connector? Because it would be really nice to have an antenna connector. What Bluetooth chip does it use specifically? And what spec does that chip support? As well as what is the transmit power? So just as an FYI, there are devices that are called class one devices, which have a maximum transmit power of 20 decibel milliwatts. So DBM, this is the most common thing that you'll see used to specify transmission power, but 20 decibel milliwatts because decibels is logarithmic scale. That is hundred milliwatts of transmit power. And that roughly equates to hundred meters uh, under typical path loss conditions. Class 2 devices have maximum transmit power of 4 dBm or 2.5 milliwatts, and that's about 10 meters. And Class 3 are very low. They have 0 dBm, which is 1 milliwatt, and that is about 1 meter. So when we're looking at this Raspberry Pi 4B or Raspberry Pi 0, we can see that they have 8 to 12 dBm for basic rate, that's Bluetooth Classic, or Bluetooth Low Energy 8.5 dBm. So somewhere between 10 and 100 meters. So amongst these various things that I was looking at, one of the ones that I already had access to was a Beagle Bone Black, and that did have an antenna connector. So that was highly desirable. But what was less desirable is that it said it only supported the spec up to Bluetooth 4.2. So that would potentially mean that if I was doing some sniffing and some device was sending more advanced packets from newer specs, then it would just not have any idea what's going on and it would just drop them right on the floor. Also, you can see the transmit power here is a little bit below these other Raspberry Pis. So of the devices that I had easy access to, I had Raspberry Pi Zero, which comes in at around $15, has half a gig of RAM and one gigahertz single core CPU. Raspberry Pi 4 is $35 to $55 and 1 to 4 gigabytes of RAM, 1.5 quad core CPU. And the BeagleBone Black is about $72 when I got it, but it's $111 and now it's kind of generally out of stock and deprecated. But it had an antenna connector. And the reason I'm mentioning these, how much RAM and what speed their CPUs go at, is because what I'm really interested in is how long will this device actually be able to run off of battery pack. So for instance, if I've got a battery pack like this, I can stick a little USB monitor in it, and this will tell me you know, how many milliamp hours it's using and how long it's been running overall. Then I continue until it hits 0%. I take a look and I see, okay, this one ran for 21 hours. This was a Raspberry Pi 4, and it used 9,000 milliamp hours. Now my battery says that it's rated for 14,000 milliamp hours, so this battery may already be dying and it's down at 63% of its capacity. So when I graph all of that, which I only did, you know, I did this ad hoc to start with and I just made nice charts for you. The Raspberry Pi Zero W is the clear winner in terms of battery runtime. And I think this fundamentally comes down to the fact that, you know, it has a low amount of RAM, so it's not continuously spending current refreshing its RAM, and also this was a single core system. So it's slow, but it's good enough for Bluetooth collection. And actually, when I made this graph and found out the BeagleBone Black was this high in runtime, actually made me think I need to reconsider this. So I'll probably have to be uh, getting this working in the future. So why do I want these things to run off a of battery? Well, this is why. What do you see here? Do you just see some annoying traffic jam? Because that's not what I see. I see delicious, delicious Bluetooth data waiting to be sniffed. I see slow moving targets that I can make an active connection to, to collect information. So I used to hate traffic jams, but now I love them. They're great for Bluetooth sniffing. So what I can do is I can take a Bluetooth sniffer, put it in a box, lock it up with a bike lock over traffic like this, and for instance, collect 15,000 named devices in a couple of days that the runtime of a Raspberry Pi Zero affords me. Also, the Raspberry Pi Zero, because it's only $15, if someone eventually steals one, I'm not that sad. So if that's my hardware setup, what's my software setup? Well, I'm not proud of it, but it's mostly bash scripts. Bash scripts are on Linux command line tools. 
99% of my data is just bash scripts with Python scripts to analyze it. Now I did do the quote unquote right thing and try to make a BlueZ Dbus API mechanism in C and then take that data and send it directly into MySQL. And that's the way you're supposed to do it, but it's much more complicated and I just quite frankly found it easier to just parse the HCI logs that you can get for basically no effort out of the Linux command line tools. So I didn't release this because it's less capable than what I already had. Okay, that's it about my setup. Now let's get you some background information, understand what you're going to be seeing coming up. First thing is that there is a thing called Bluetooth Device Address or BD Adder, Bluetooth Device Address. This thing is the address that's used by devices. You can kind of think of it like a MAC address in Ethernet, except it's not. So in Bluetooth Classic, it is basically like a MAC address. But in Bluetooth Low Energy, there are four different types of addresses. So the first is called a public address, and that is always trackable. That does look like a Ethernet MAC address because it has a company ID, which is really the IEEE Organizational Unit Identifier, OUI, which is like an Ethernet MAC address, OUI. It's 24 bits that ostensibly uniquely identify exactly the company that this hardware was made for. Now this version public address is always trackable in Bluetooth low energy and because classic looks the same way it's always trackable there as well. It's just static, it's never changing, and also it has the benefit of it can tell you a little bit about the company. Next there is static address which is trackable and depends on the re-randomization interval but in practice I haven't seen any re-randomization. So the static address can be used in two ways. It can be assigned and fixed for the lifetime of the device or it can be changed at boot up, but it cannot change during runtime. In practice, I've never actually seen these things change. So the format of it is that the most significant bit is one and the second most significant bit is one and the rest of it is all random. So you can just flip this around in your mind and imagine it as hex and you can see that this means that the if you see the bit that says I'm a random Bluetooth address, but then if you see the most significant bits start with F or E or D or C in hexadecimal, then that means it is a static address. And that's actually the only way that you know which of these three types it is, is based on the two most significant bits. Then we have the resolvable address. Now this is minimally trackable in principle because it's not trackable. It shouldn't be trackable just based on the address itself, but other metadata and other information could be giving it away. So the format of this is most significant bits is zero one. So you can imagine it means it has to start or the most significant nibble has to start with seven or six or five or four in hexadecimal representation. And then there's just some format where basically assuming the two devices have the same key, then they'll be able to resolve or figure out, you know, whether this is a device that has the same key as them. We don't care about that. We just care about the fact that it's notionally supposed to be the address that is not trackable because it should change over time. Then we finally have the non-resolvable addresses, which is the same thing, except most significant bits are zero. So it's going to be either zero, one, two, or three, and the rest of it's all random and has no significance. Now in this talk, if you see something that looks like this, what you're seeing is the output of the Linux BTMon tool. So, and I will also often highlight when we're looking at some example, and if BTMon says it's public, then it was that public type of address from the previous chart. And theoretically you can interpret the OUI and it would be something, but this particular vendor chose to put in garbage. And also the name happens to have exactly the same name as the BD adder in this case. So great, this particular device, the Triones, is custom car headlights and it's public and it's got a unique name so you can totally track someone based on their car headlights. On the other hand, if you see something like this, it's from the tellmeeverything.py script that I've released to analyze the kind of data that I collect. Same idea here is telling you that this device is public and hey, guess what? This thing turns out to be a diabetes management device. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Wiggle. Wiggle is a crowdsourced infrastructure for Wi-Fi sniffing and stumbling and capturing information, crowdsourcing it, uploading it to the internet potentially if you want. They don't do it by default, but if you want, you can upload it and then you can have nice visualizations like this. Originally it was for Wi-Fi only, but they added Bluetooth support in 2019. I bought an old $50 junk Pixel 3 that I like to run Wiggle on and I always bring it along with me while I'm doing my other Bluetooth sniffing because very frequently uh, the Pixel will be able to pick up GPS where my GPS module for Linux does not. Unfortunately, Wiggle, although they support Bluetooth, they don't have most of the data we would want to have for Bluetooth and a lot of the data I'm going to be digging into further in this talk. 
But one thing that I think is worth mentioning is that while it is originally for Wi-Fi, in my short period of time using Wiggle, and this is actually old data, I actually saw an order of magnitude more Bluetooth devices than I saw Wi-Fi devices. So there are way, way more Bluetooth devices out there than Wi-Fi. And actually back in 2004, Herford and Mulliner in their blueprinting paper said currently the actual number of Bluetooth radios in use is four times higher than the number of Wi-Fi radios. So in 2004, it was a four to one ratio and now it is greater than 10 to one. This again, I think just speaks to the importance of getting our hands around the Bluetooth wireless vulnerability problem. So that's it for the prelude. Let me once again present you with the takeaways. I said Bluetooth sniffing goals are different from Wi-Fi goals, right? Wi-Fi, you're looking to see if something is at the same location, whether it has some particular security protocol enabled and whatnot. I'm more interested in things like knowing whether or not a given Bluetooth device is going to be vulnerable to a firmware vulnerability because no one actually knows today what all is affected by firmware vulnerabilities when they're found. And again, as I said, there's many devices that do not have human readable names. We have no idea what those are. And there's many devices that do have human readable names, but unfortunately we don't know what those are. And I'm looking at you, B pound A. So I want to talk to you about some anecdotes of different things I've seen at different locations around the world. Before the pandemic had actually started, I already had plans to leave my job at Apple in the Bay Area and move back to my house in Maryland. You can make great money out in Silicon Valley, but then you also have to spend all of that money if you want to own a house. And I already owned a house in Maryland, so I would rather just move back and work remote. But then the pandemic happened, and instead of taking what was supposed to be a leisurely drive down through the south of the United States, visit New Orleans and other states that I've never visited before, instead it turned into a pandemic cannonball run because we basically just booked it as fast as we could across the country in order to get home and not have to, you know, fly on a plane or anything like that. Now this is the just GPS route information, not the Bluetooth devices. Here is the Bluetooth devices, just to make it a little more easy for you to see. And so basically you can see that kind of like chunk at a time, we made our way across the US and I clearly didn't have GPS data for here. I did get the Bluetooth devices, I just don't know where they are located. I should also probably say at this point that I didn't know that Wiggle collected Bluetooth data yet. So I hadn't found that yet. That's why I didn't have the redundancy of being able to collect that data through Wiggle as well. So then because I knew this trip was coming up, I knew I needed to get a Bluetooth sniffer into a state where it could work across the country. And I wanted to make sure I could get all that data because how often do you drive across the entire country? So I just, you know, sniffed around in the Bay Area. This is the GPS trace. This is the Bluetooth sniff data. Now I'm going to save the anecdote about what I saw at some hotels in San Jose until later in the talk. So let's instead start in my current local area, Maryland, and talk about the curious case of BLE003U. Now I had seen this device, BLE003, around Maryland, and when I eventually put it into Wiggle, I saw, hmm, it doesn't seem to be anywhere except the United States. Drilling down in the United States, I saw, well, it's all over the place, but it's really concentrated around where I am and up into New York. And when I drilled down further, I saw it's actually really concentrated in Maryland. And if you look at the borders of like Washington, D.C. or Virginia, it pretty much just straight up does not cross the border into those. So somehow it is geographically isolated and restricted to Maryland. But whatever it is, it also seems to be making an appearance in Philadelphia and New York. So when we Google this device, we come up with this particular Bluetooth module. And so modules are things where basically a given Bluetooth chip is sort of repackaged into a module with an antenna potentially and sold by an intermediate vendor. Okay, so this probably means that there's this module being used in some devices and the device vendors just don't care enough to actually change it away from what is probably a default beaconing name. So where is it actually used? Well, Googling around, I haven't seen any good explanations that could actually tell me why this is so geographically restricted to Maryland. I can see references to BLE003U in these Bluetooth fireplaces, saw someone's Reddit post where they said they think it has to do with their Govy TV black backlights, but I don't think it's that necessarily because I know there's a naming convention now for Govy backlights. 
but they said they turned off their backlights and this thing disappeared. So that's possible, but it still really wouldn't explain what's going on. And so for a long time, I had this just in the back of my mind. It was just annoying. I didn't know what it was, but sometimes you just have to accept that you can't figure out what things are. But recently I had a little bit of insight on my way back from DEF CON. So I was taking the Metro, the subway, and it was disrupted at one Metro station. And then I had to take a bus. And so I, of course, had my sniffer running on the way back from DEF CON and I took the bus. And what I started to notice as I was just, I had my uh, Bluetooth sniffer phone application open as well, just the typical things like light blue that you can find on the app stores. And I was looking at it and what I started to notice was a little bit of a pattern where I would see these BLE 003Us popping up seemingly near things like gas stations. So I'm sniffing and I see one at a shell. Later on, I'm sniffing, I see one, there's a US fuel. And then also there's an Exxon. So I started to see this pattern occurring while I'm just sitting on the bus waiting and watching and seeing if anything interesting shows up on the sniffer. Now I'd also known from past experience that they exhibit around liquor stores. I knew this because there was a liquor store next to the pet grooming place where my wife went. And one time I like wandered around it trying to figure out what the device is. And I thought, you know, maybe it's just these cameras that they have outside of the store or something like that. Couldn't figure it out. But after having seen this and putting it together with my previous thoughts about it, it eventually hit me, what do gas stations and liquor stores and convenience stores potentially have in common that would be Maryland specific? And here I have to tell you that convenience stores are not allowed to sell liquor in Maryland, nor are gas stations. And the answer was lottery tickets specifically something like the Maryland lottery, right? That would kind of potentially explain why this stops at the Maryland border and why maybe they have similar things in Pennsylvania and New York, but they're using something different in Virginia, so it doesn't show up there. So I went to one of the convenience stores, went to some gas stations, sat outside of them and started seeing this. I literally walked up to a liquor store and just kind of stood right there next to the thing and saw really strong signal strength. And that made me happy. And you can't see here, but you can see here, hey, look, there's an antenna on top of this thing. So that's very interesting. And also we have this natural experiment where basically I went to a 7-Eleven and they had their Mega Million sign off and I didn't see BLE 003. So that was like, okay, at this point I'm elated. I finally figured out what this thing is. It's been bugging me for a long time. Got it. So I go in, I take a picture of the back. I see an FCC ID. That's awesome. I can go ahead and look it up on the end. What? This is not what I want to see. The FCC site does not say that it transmits in 2.4 gigahertz for Bluetooth, only this 400 megahertz. That is not great. And then coming back to this picture, looking at it a little more closely in my rush to find the FCC ID, I had not noticed that actually even on the back of the device, it says that it only transmits in the 400 megahertz range. So my current status is still vexed. I am not happy about the fact that I don't know what these devices are but I'm trying to be at peace with it. They're definitely correlated to uh, gas stations, liquor store, convenience stores. Pretty sure it has something to do with Maryland Lottery. Still working to figure it out. Got to go to some places and ask them to turn off equipment until it disappears, but we'll see. Still trying to figure that out, but I'm vexed. Moving on to a little bit of leisure travel. Last spring, I took a road trip down from Washington down all the way to Florida and the Florida Keys. So if you're going down to Florida, of course, you got to stop by Disney World and sniff the Bluetooth. And that's exactly what I did. So this is all of my data only. So Wiggle lets you sort it down to say, show only devices that you were the first to see. So this is just my data. And this is all Bluetooth devices, including devices that don't have names. If I filter that down to only devices with names, I see quite a few less. But when I look at those names, I see one recurring thing that appears a lot something called Disney MBLE. If I filter it down to that, you, know, you can see that's almost all of the data was Disney MBLE. So it seems to be that there's a lot of official looking Bluetooth Disney devices. Why might that be? Well, if you check the fact, it says that at locations such as Star Wars Galaxy Edge, select locations through Walt Disney World Resort include BLE beacons, which are small radio transmitters, blah, 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 blah. Improve the guest experience. It also says, in addition, when you're asking about what information is collected about you, it says your BLE enabled devices may also broadcast data that when received by our BLE beacons may allow us to provide other interactive personalized experiences. And indeed, at some places like Galaxy's Edge, there are things where if you have the Disney Bluetooth application or some wrist 
transmitter that I'll show in a second, uh, it will, you know, take and do some customized experience for you. I didn't do or see that, but I've seen YouTube videos of it. So if we go back and we look at everyone's Wiggle data, not just mine, and only for Disney MBLE, this is what we see. And if we zoom out, we'll actually see that this is all over the place at Disney Resorts. This is the Magic Kingdom, Animal Kingdom, Hollywood Studios, Epcot, and whatever that is, Sarasota Springs. So this is all over the place. Now, I actually stayed at one of the Disney hotels, and then I saw that there were Bluetooth devices beaconing in these areas too. And also, when you look at the Bluetooth data on Wiggle, you can see it's clearly going along some roads sometimes. So one possibility for that is maybe the Disney shuttles that they take you from the hotels to the parks. Maybe those things have BLE transmitters on them. That would be kind of pointless. You're not going to have an interactive experience on the Disney bus. Or the other alternative is that there are these things called magic bands. And these are the things that are used for those interactive experiences. But the original point of them was that they were used basically like a ticket and you had ways to get into certain rides faster and then you would scan this device and that would get you in just to confirm that you were the person who was authorized to go on the ride faster. So the next theory would be that these magic bands might be beaconing and people running Wiggle are picking up magic bands. Now, initially I thought, well, looking at all the data and everywhere that this is seen, maybe these are not beaconing because it doesn't look like there's very many of them seen on the Jungle Cruise, for instance. So maybe Disney's got their stuff embedded all over the place, but they don't have it embedded in here. And so, okay, that makes sense. But now I am inclined to think that the Magic Bands do beacon because eventually when I went to KSC, the Kennedy Space Center, elsewhere in Florida, place where they launch uh, space missions from, and quite frankly, this is the Disney of space with all sorts of awesome rides and stuff. The Rocket Garden is awesome. Very cool place for nerds. Anyways, a whole bunch of Disney MBLEs here as well. So the conclusion is that they probably beacon and it's not just Disney collecting information about Kennedy Space Center experiences as well. And indeed, if you bother to go look at the Wiggle data, you'll see the, the United States is crawling in Disney MBLE and also the United Kingdom, but not most of Europe for some reason that I don't really understand. So yeah, Disney MBLE is clearly coming from Magic Bands as well. But while we're looking around here at Kennedy Space Center 3, saw this other thing called Abbott and looked into it, and that is a glucose meter, and we'll come back to that later. Now on to Miami, Florida, which has a hop-on, hop-off bus, which is the perfect way to sniff the city. There you go. That's basically the exact route. And this is us escaping Miami. So it's great. You go on the top, you stick your Bluetooth sniffer right there. You got a perfect unobstructed view of everything that's going on. So what's there to see in Miami? Well, they've got Coors Light feature clocks. Coors Light feature clock. And I was like, why did, what's the Coors Light thing? And apparently it's just an LED sign where you can use Bluetooth to customize what it says on the sign. Also in Miami, I saw something called Uggs, and I was like, okay, what's that? And that ultimately led me down a rabbit hole that says this Ugg ZZC is an older Bluetooth 2.1 version of the Ugg ZZF. So this Ugg ZZC is what I actually saw there. And those are apparently way more popular in Germany than they are around the U.S. So my theory is that this is probably something from, well, it says it's from Alps, like Googling it. It's from Alps. Alps oftentimes makes car audio entertainment systems. And the fact that it's so prevalent in Germany makes me think it's probably from German cars. And so, yeah, like we got German cars here in the U.S. too, but they got a lot of German cars in Germany. What else? Well, we've got no DVR, and I was wondering, why are they telling me that they have no DVR? And it turns out this is not no, this is Night Owl DVR. Night Owl DVR, or collecting information from surveillance cameras. Final thing from Miami, Hello Fairy. And I thought maybe this was someone's individual device name, perhaps, but this is where Wiggle shines. You just go search for Hello Fairy on Wiggle, and you see, yes, there's thousands of Hello Fairies, and so it's not an individual's device. And what is that? Google it. Well, it is controllable LED lighting. So some phone app that you use to talk to your LED lighting so you can have the best Christmas tree in the neighborhood. Also in Florida, happen to stop by Key West. If you're not aware, there's a whole bunch of islands at the tip of Florida called the Florida Keys. And so here I saw the Control Rigid Job Site Radio. And I was like, oh, okay, we've got a radio with a Bluetooth radio in it. But uh, no, I thought it was going to be walkie-talkies. Like Job Site Radio sounds like walkie-talkies to me. But it is just a Bluetooth boombox, essentially, that is ruggedized and hardened for getting kicked around at job sites. Elsewhere on the island, I also saw the Rigid Mini Radio. 
Now, the thing about Key West is that it's actually a really expensive tourist destination. The hotel prices were ridiculous, really was not enthused by that. And so what can you find in ridiculously expensive tourist destinations? Ridiculously expensive Bluetooth thermometers where you pay $239 so that you can have it sent to your phone rather than just pay $15 to look at it. Awesome. But when you stop on by these sort of affluent locations, you can find out that the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. Because in Key West, they have the Furbo 3, which is a 360 degree camera that tracks your dog and is capable of tossing dog treats to them. The future is now. Or for instance, you can have Bluetooth toothbrushes. And I just hope that they have an option for this app to speak in Hal's voice and say, watch your pressures in these areas, Ken. Moving on to hacker conferences. Netherlands, The Hague, Hardware.io 2021, got there, found out that my sniffer, the Raspberry Pi, would straight up not boot, and I didn't have the necessary stuff to fix it there. And I was doing a training, so I was busy, so I couldn't run around trying to fix it. Anyways, Hardware.io 2022. So in 2022, I came with more redundant sniffers and made double sure that it was working and had extra flash chips and everything. Now, here's some GPS data, and you can see that it actually doesn't capture from within the hotel. Uh, again, as always, the Pixel catches the GPS data much more effectively than my little USB GPS dongle. So what's interesting about Hardware.io is it's the first time that I actually noticed flipper devices. So we're going to come back to the flippers later, but they are a definite signal that hackers found. Then just a miscellaneous thing while I was at the Amsterdam airport, there's this thing, Melomania OnePlus, that actually has right and left headphones that are apparently beaconing independently, which I hadn't actually seen before. Now let's talk about my most recent location data coming from Ring Zero and DEF CON in Las Vegas. Here's the overall data, and then here's the splat coming from the Palms Hotel. So I was doing a training there, and I had my sniffer up against a window because, again, I wanted to get GPS, and so this is just the splat of all the GPS locations being inaccurate for this wind amount of thing. Obviously, there was all sorts of sniffing going on in here, but I didn't have a GPS signal. Similarly, at the Caesars Forum, where DEF CON was held, I was sitting probably right about there, nearby the exit, and so this is just the splat of all the GPS data when I could actually get it. Most of the time, couldn't get it. And here's the wiggle view of just my data from Vegas. Obviously, you can see way more data from other people. Now, I don't know what you see there, but I personally see like, you know, there's the torso, there's the head, there's the hand, there's the leg, there's the leg, and then boom, this is basically crane kick. So over four days at the Palms, I saw about 1,300 unique named devices. There were also seven flippers in that, which again, flippers kind of seem like they're a secret signal that there's hackers around. And indeed, I wonder whether I'm going to see any flippers when I go to a conference like RSA in the future. There were also three glucose monitors, which we'll be talking about later, and one Bluetooth-enabled LG WebOS TV per room in the good tower, not the tower that I was staying in. So afterwards, I went and, you know, I literally walked every floor of the towers because I wanted to see what kind of stuff there was, and apparently they get all the WebOS TVs. But I would say one of the most interesting things that I saw at the Palms was things advertising as pay range. So their normal advertisement was pay range, but if you sent a query and said, what's your name, then it would say my name is blue radios and then some six digits six, six hex digits which happens to correspond to the last six digits of the bd adder additionally some instead of saying there were blue radios would say blue key pay range so what is that well googling it pay range is a company that offers vending machine services and blue key is some sort of dongle that probably gets plugged in on the inside of the vending machine and so how their overall platform works is that they're trying to make it so that essentially vendors who have things like vending machines, instead of just accepting credit cards and stuff like that and cash, of course, they would like you to accept their special pay range payment system where they basically have the consumer runs an app. Your vending machine gets this little dongle thing plugged into it. The dongle can communicate to the phone via Bluetooth, and then the phone can communicate to a back end saying, you know, okay, this customer has this much dollars in their account. And so, yes, they have enough money to pay you vending machine. And then the vending machine vends stuff. 
So here I will just point out that, you know, when I was in high school, hacking vending machines was, you know, and all the zines and stuff like that, it was as simple as, you know, put some pieces of tape on the piece of, you know, the dollar bill and then pull the dollar bill out. Nowadays, if you want to hack a vending machine, I guess you need to learn something about Bluetooth. The other interesting thing about this is the fact that it said its name was Blue Radios with part of its BD adder. And when you Google Blue Radios, you see that they are a maker of Bluetooth modules. They make a bunch of different modules, but actually behind the scenes, this Bluetooth module is just utilizing some chips such as Nordic NRF 52840. Now there's a mini takeaway here, which is that sometimes when you can identify the presence of a Bluetooth module maker, that can give you a set of possible chips which they use in their modules, such as this Nordic NRF 52840. So which chip they're using is actually one of the things I said at the beginning I want to know. So there you go. Now I've got a little bit of information of what I actually want to know here. It's all anecdotes, but somewhere in there, there's the information that I'm interested in. And when it comes to DEF CON, I can't actually tell you how many devices I saw only at DEF CON because again, GPS data is very unreliable inside of buildings. And also I ran around the Las Vegas Strip sniffing devices every morning. So I can't go based on just uh, timestamps necessarily. So while I was walking around in Las Vegas, I happen to usually have uh, Bluetooth scanning apps up on, uh, so I can see if there's anything interesting as I'm walking around and then stop if I see something I've never seen before and just hope that my Bluetooth sniffer will eventually see it and query it and get additional information above and beyond what I can get from these sniffing apps. And when I wandered into the Win Casino area, not just the Win, but actually the casino area, all of a sudden a whole bunch of things popped up called IGT Card Reader. And those looked something like this. IGT card reader, and then manufacturer name, IGT, model number, and hardware revision string. So that's pretty interesting. What's IGT? Well, IGT is a gaming machine hardware maker. So they make things like these virtual slot machines, which are essentially just really glorified computers with multiple screens. And indeed, you can actually buy parts from them. They have a store. And for instance, they have a Bluetooth module that you can buy. Now, the thing is, you have to log in to see prices. You can't log in unless you have an account. You can't get an account unless they vet you. So I don't know that I'm ever going to be able to buy one of those kind of things. But hey, if you've got an IGT account and you'd like me to check out their Bluetooth modules, maybe you should uh, get in touch. And for instance, while I was wandering around, I saw, you know, here's an example where one thing was bugging out and it was accidentally displaying IGT on one of the screens. And additionally, this presumably is what the nominal IGT card reader would be. Now, this particular device, I don't think was actually advertising Bluetooth. This just happened to be the device on that. And I wanted to take a picture for posterity. Also, miscellaneously, while I was Googling on eBay or searching eBay, rather, uh, I, you know, I just always want to see, like, are these kind of devices, you know, freely available? Can I buy them off eBay? And it turns out that actually the chips that have the storage for the games are available on eBay in some cases. And you can see that this Ocean Magic is exactly that Ocean Magic. All right, digging further into what is IGT and why do, what's up with this IGT card reader thing, eventually found a document that basically showed this nice and obvious thing where it's talking about the player taps the Bluetooth sensor with their phone. So they were essentially talking about a mechanism where instead of having to have cards that have the stored value of, you know, how much money you're gained or lost while you're playing the games, instead you just have a virtual card that's on your phone and then it communicates to the Bluetooth reader uh, via very close. So it says taps the Bluetooth sensor. And this actually jives with what I was seeing from the IGT card reader because it says it has a transmit power of negative 72 dBm. That's extremely low and that's the kind of thing you would only expect to go like mere centimeters or you know inches that kind of thing. So that's why you're tapping. You're not tapping because it's like NFC or something like that. It's because it's extremely low Bluetooth power. On the other hand if it's such extremely low Bluetooth power then how come I'm seeing dozens of these things in the Wink Casino? Good question Zeno and as my wife said it's probably because they're running at different transmit powers when they're doing transactions versus advertisements and stuff like that. Anyways besides Win, where are these IGT card readers advertising? Well there's a whole bunch of them at coordinates 00, zero on Wigo which is again why you should always not necessarily believe the stuff you see on Wiggle. Uh, anyone can submit any data to wiggle, you know, this shouldn't be used for, you know, forensic investigations or anything like that. Anyone can submit any data. And in this particular case, they submitted erroneous data. 
But other places that we see, well, there's the win on this map of Las Vegas in Paradise. And then there were four locations named very similarly, Texas Station, Palace Station, Boulder Station, and Sunset Station. So it kind of makes sense that a company that's running multiple casinos would potentially be using all the same sort of technologies. But then elsewhere, we saw it at Palms and Bellagio and Aria and Park MGM and Virgin Hotels and MGM Grand and Luxor and Mandalay Bay and Green Valley Ranch. So it's all over the place. Also, this one, I zoomed in on it. You know, theoretically, this is the Strat Hotel Casino Tower. When I zoomed in on it, it was kind of external to that. I didn't choose to label that. But again, that's probably just a GPS error or something like that. And just because you see it big on Win and small on some others does not mean anything. Like the MGM Grand, for instance, very, very difficult to get a GPS signal inside of that place. And consequently, there's probably all sorts of them in there. They're just not going to graph on Wiggle or graph on my data, but, you know, they would be captured in the raw data. Oh, yeah, that's what I just said. Thanks, Rudell. So then just zooming out and looking around further, we can see that these are found at places like Agua Caliente, Hot Water, Palm Springs, California, but more importantly at their gas stations, so you can also gamble while you're waiting for your tank to fill up. Then there's locations like the Four Winds Casino South Bend, Indiana, and the Four Winds Casino in New Buffalo, Michigan, a few miles across the border. Again, it makes sense that companies might deploy the same sort of IT infrastructure and therefore the same sort of casino infrastructure. Also places like Atlantic City, New Jersey, and there was exactly one at the Ocean Casino in Atlantic City, but again, probably GPS issues. Now, the real big question here is, are they supposed to be advertising like this or are they misconfigured? And to that, my answer is, shoulder shrug, I don't know. This bears future investigation, don't you think? Now, I said that I was running around Las Vegas every morning, staying on East Coast time, so I'm getting up at like 4 a.m. their time. And let me just tell you the low ROI places to sniff in Vegas, the fancy pants shops. Yes, Dior and Louis Vuitton and Tiffany & Co. Checking these places out at 5 a.m. when there's no one else around. Yeah, they don't have any general Bluetooth devices sitting in their store beaconing. Sorry, you need to be there when the humans are actually there. Finally, just a comment from my DEF CON sniffing experience. Of course, the best places to sniff are the choke points like this. Here at the Caesars Forum, there's these escalators where basically everyone has to come down from. Behind me, there's also technically some doors to the exterior world, but it's hot and most people don't use those doors. So, great place to sniff, choke points. And this is also a preview of my upcoming work. This is the additional information that I'm trying to collect to figure out more effectively what kind of chips devices are using. In October of 2023, I ran around to four security conferences and presented a much shorter version of this talk. But for each location, I wanted to find some local flavor and local data and see what was interesting and present it to the people there. So starting with Hacktivity in Budapest, we can see that this is all of the Wiggle data and this is just my tiny little bit of data on the way from the airport there. But on my way from the airport to the venue, I took the Minibud shuttle and the shuttle dropped me off last. And this was actually preferable than taking a cab because that meant that I got to run around downtown Budapest and find extra Bluetooth data. So again, Bluetooth sniffing will change your life. You'll love traffic and you'll love being dropped off last by the airport shuttle. Now, one of the data points that stuck out to me was something called Hypernet TV Box or Hypernet TV Box. And these are basically just Android TV devices. You connect them to a dumb TV and it makes it a smart TV. So in Hungary, we see a bunch of these things called Hypernet TV Box. And from this, we can see it looks like it's mostly in Hungary. One person over here in Germany, perhaps a Hungarian who moved there. And then there's an example down in Serbia. But because of the way I was looking at this in Wiggle, I found this Hypernet TV Box as well. And that one seemed to be isolated primarily to Serbia. And indeed, you can see that this Yetl company that sells these things, they've got, you know, Serbian roots. So basically, we've got two things, and the BD adders are the same for each of them in the given region. And if you look those BD adder OUIs up, you'll see that these are two different Chinese manufacturing companies. So again, Yetl probably just outsourcing this to two different Chinese manufacturers, one for the Serbian market, one for the Hungarian market. Another thing that jumped out at me at one point were these things called iHunt watches. And so I looked at this and I see sometimes on Wiggle, I see these things with the last four digits being the same as what's advertised in the name. And sometimes the last four digits are not the same. And the difference seems to be whether it's advertising via Bluetooth Classic or Bluetooth Low Energy. 
You can see once again that this has primarily a Eastern European geographic distribution. That's because it turns out that iHunt is a Romanian company. Now, another conference I went to was Hackfest, which is in Lviv, which is just outside of Quebec City. And so here's all the wiggle data, and here's my little bit of data going from the airport to the conference venue. And then once at the conference venue, walking from my hotel over to the conference and up to the mall when it suited me. Now, the thing I had seen here that I have never seen before was something advertising as Ultimate V6. And when I looked that up, I believed that that was a Sounds Good Ultimate V6 earbuds looking like this. The reason I thought that is because this Sounds Good adventure began in 2019 at a local flea market in Quebec City. So yes, this is a local business that seems to be making these earbuds. Except, of course, they're not really making it. They're outsourcing it to a Chinese company to make it. So these, unfortunately for anyone who happens to be using them in Quebec, it, they are using public media adders, which means you can be tracked by your earbuds. And there is this little bit of data here in the UUID 16s indicating that there's something about Qualcomm. So that might give us a little indication of what kind of chip it may use. So when we dig into what this Shenzhen Bolutech technology company is, we can find things like this, where you have some mesh node. And this is not the thing that would actually be used in this chip because mesh is a different Bluetooth protocol. But if we look at that picture and we rotate it and we zoom in, we can see a reference to CSR, Cambridge Silicon Radio. Cambridge Silicon Radio was acquired by Qualcomm. So that all makes sense. And here's a much better picture of something with a CSR logo. So we might reasonably infer that these devices use these CSR chips. Now looking at the geographic spread, they're relatively common in Quebec City, but really common in Montreal. But then going down to somewhere like Toronto, they don't seem to be common at all. But speaking of Toronto, we've got Sector 2023, another conference that I went to in Canada. Wandering around downtown Toronto, here's the conference venue, what stands out? Well, as I'm wandering around downtown with my Wiggle app open, just looking for names I've never seen before, I see this Miro. And what is Miro? Well, whatever it is, it's something that's only found in Toronto and Vancouver, nowhere else in Canada, nowhere else in North America. So Googling it, what do we get? We get Miro.co. And this is a sort of interesting use case for Bluetooth devices that I hadn't seen before. So they have these tags that are basically like air tags, and you attach these to the keychain of your janitors. And then you put sensors on the places the janitors are supposed to clean. And using that, you can get data about when your janitor is going around your facilities, you know, what time they got there and, you know, when the facility is cleaned or not cleaned. And then also they seem to have a use case, for instance, for uh, shared workspaces or like hot desking, where essentially you could have, um, you know, you can tell that these desks are occupied because these people perhaps have these tags on their badges or whatever. And then they have a little sensor like this underneath the desk and that tells them okay there's a person here right now because of their very close proximity so looking at the about section on Mero, they are a toronto based company so it makes sense that these are mostly found in toronto and then perhaps they've got some vancouver affiliate that they're selling through digging in one nice piece of information just pops out and that's in the manufacturer specific data they seem to be using the nordic semiconductor uh, company id so we can reasonably infer that these devices are using nordic chips which is one of the things that i want to know and for what it's worth looking at different devices they do seem to broadcast different data i don't know what it means but that's for someone to figure out through reverse engineering and the final conference where I presented this in October 2023 was NoHat in Bergamo, Italy. So here's me coming in down to the Lynn Airport, going to the Central Train Station, taking the train up to Bergamo. Could have taken a direct flight, but I'd rather take the slow way so that I can collect more data. Now this was just to point out to the folks at the Bergamo conference that it looks like the folks in Milan are doing a much, much better job of running Wiggle and that they should probably get on that. But here's all the Bergamo data, and here's my tiny contribution on the way from the train station up to the conference venue. And so while I was still in Milan, I started to see these devices called Daikin. And I didn't know what that was. But when I looked around here, you know, the conference was here, and I walked up this road and down to over here, and then this was the hotel, so literally less than a block away. Then as I'm wandering around, I see that there's a whole bunch of these Daikins here on the street. So I decided, okay, this is going to be my target. What is this? So I didn't know what Daikin was because apparently Wiggle has only ever seen like five of these in all of North America, but apparently Europeans are quite familiar with Daikin because it is quite common there. So it turns out that Daikin makes HVAC, like air conditioning and heating type things. 
And so specifically, I believe that that particular device is like a Bluetooth thermostat. I googled this on the train and came up with this, and then furthermore was confirmed in that, again, walking past the conference venue to the hotel, there was literally a Daikin store right on the street across the street from the hotel. So I took and snapped a picture of that saying, yep, pretty sure this is the HVAC stuff. Although the funny bit here is that actually there were no Daikin devices broadcasting here. I like stood and was like, okay, I'm going to inquire here, but nothing in the showroom was apparently broadcasting Bluetooth. So drilling down on the devices themselves, what do we got? We've got a device name of Daikin, but sometimes a device name of Sala, which is room in Italian. And so what's the difference? Well, the Sala is in a scan response and the Daikin is just in an advertisement. So we've got something like this, Daikin being advertised in those advind packets and some sort of thing that is perhaps a customer customized name coming back in scan, re scan response packets. Now, why do I think that is a customer customized name? Because we have things like room, which is generic, but then we have things like cucina, which is Italian for kitchen. And we've got, I'll say, ricercolo, which is recycling in Italian. And additionally, we've got things like this, where they have what looks like a default name, BRC1H, and then the last 24 bits of the BD adder, 5031.18, 5031.18, and A5E491, A5E491. So Googling that BRC1H, that is a prefix on these seemingly uninitialized things, yes, we get one of these thermostats. So we're pretty clear that that is probably what these devices are. What other kind of information can we learn? Well, we've got two references here to Universal Electronics, which I didn't know what that is. So I search it and I come up with UEI partners with many Fortune 500 customers, including Comcast, Vivint, Samsung, LG, Sony, and Daikin. Daikin being the only one I had never actually heard of before. So they make lots of things. They're a electronics manufacturer. One of the things they make, just another one of the hits when I was Googling them, is that not just thermostats, but home automation and security thermostats. So again, you know, what are the implications if there's DOS bugs or vulnerabilities that allow arbitrary code execution? You don't just take down someone's thermostat and make their, you know, house too hot or too cold, which, you know, just to be clear, that can have implications like, you know, if it's the winter and you take down someone's thermostat and now the water freezes in their pipes, that's kind of a problem. But yes, you can also potentially take down someone's security system. But the first hit when I was searching for Universal Electronics was this. This nice little page where they're advertising about how they're going to be adding Matter support. And Matter, if you haven't heard of it, used to be known as Connected Home over IP. It's basically a new protocol or a new effort in order to bring the internet protocol to devices like Bluetooth devices that don't naturally speak IP. So personally, I think Matter will be great. It'll make smart homes much better, and it'll add a whole bunch of attack surface to these Bluetooth devices that I want to attack. So I'm licking my lips in anticipation of the arrival of Matter. Anyways, additionally, we can see that they do have GAT information, although my scanner never actually successfully picked that information up. But when I was wandering around because I really wanted to know what kind of stuff was this, when I found the particular building that had a whole bunch of Daikin devices advertised, I just stood there until I finally could get connectivity and pulled down the device information. So again, universal electronics and other interesting goodies about firmware revisions, hardware revisions, and so forth. So in fall of 2022, my wife and I, having been fully immunized and not having gotten COVID at any point, decided to take our chances and go on vacation to Korea. So that allowed me to collect some data from Seoul, take a train ride down to Daejeon and meet with a former professor, Yang Dae Kim, head down to Jeju Island, which is the Hawaii of South Korea, with a big old volcano there, and then head up to Busan before taking the train back. We wanted to hit Busan because while my wife's from Seoul, she had never been to Busan. And Busan's kind of interesting because, as I didn't know, thanks to my superior American education, during the Korean War, actually, the North Koreans pushed all the way down and captured all of the peninsula except for a little bit right here, including Busan. So that's where all the refugees and stuff fled to. So in Seoul, I'd already been to a lot of the touristy stuff in the past, but I figured it'd be good to run around and collect some data in Gangnam, just because you never know what kind of new and interesting devices they might have there. And so, for instance, one day I decided to hop on a scooter to give me some additional distance and ran around all over the place there. And if you stare at that really long, eventually you can see the beautiful phoenix. But I would also accept a carousel horse because of the spike going right through the middle of it. Anyways, speaking of scooters... 
one of the types of scooters you can only find in Seoul, not even the rest of South Korea, not anywhere else in the world, is called kick going. So it advertises as just plain kick going. And so I thought that was interesting because we can have geographic data that is isolated to specific countries, but you can also have it isolated to specific cities. So those are public, infinitely trackable. But the interesting bit here is the fact that it advertises with a OUI of Expressif. So Expressif is a silicon chip maker, a Bluetooth chip maker. So the mini takeaway from that is that sometimes a device which is using Bluetooth Classic or BLE with a public address can have an OUI which is from the chip maker rather than the company that's actually making the device. And so that should give you a pretty strong signal of which chip the device is actually using. And hey, which chip the device is actually using is one of the things I want to know. Cool, so I got some more of that information. Another thing I saw while in Korea is MPON devices. They advertise with two different names for the exact same device, actually. So it responds both to Bluetooth Classic and Bluetooth Low Energy. And so I had data in my database for a name with BT and a name with LE. And they use public addresses, so you can either be tracked by their BD adder or the fact that they include part of the BD adder in the name, so making it unique. And so what these devices basically look like is that they're like a card reader for this high pass system. The high pass card is a stored value card for this toll road payment. So essentially you slot the card into the device and then the device connects to your phone and when you're driving through a toll, this device speaks whatever other frequency the toll readers speak. Now additionally, you'll see that it says that it has an audio source and my expectation is that that is for talking back to the phone to use audio to say like, okay, this toll was 3,701 and you have 10,000 won remaining or whatever. But when one looks with Wiggle, one sees interesting things with these MPONs. Specifically, I happen to see exactly one of them in an area that's known to be a Koreatown in Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C., this Annandale, Virginia. And so then if you zoom out, you can look across the rest of North America. And for instance, Los Angeles has a very well-known Koreatown area. But then, for instance, I was looking in the data and I saw one in Georgia, in Atlanta, and I was like, hmm, that's a little strange. I don't know that they have that large of a Korean population. But for instance, when I zoom in, there we go. There's a Korean restaurant right there. So for all I know, this might be a Koreatown area. It might have been just someone caught it on the freeway. I don't know, but it's kind of interesting to think that this kind of data, which is for a Korean specific toll road system, so it definitely doesn't exist anywhere outside of Korea, not useful outside of Korea, it can actually show you where there might be Korean populations elsewhere in the world. For instance, Calgary, Canada, or Monterey, Mexico. Another interesting thing I saw while looking around in Seoul is something that advertised as KFTC Bank Pass. And so KFTC is a nonprofit organization which manages several interbank payment systems in South Korea. So it's a bank point of sale terminal of some point. Now, I always read this like KFC, but that's neither here nor there. So looking at this data, what's interesting here? Well, it just calls itself KFTC Bank Pass, but I happen to see that in other devices, they didn't have any name, but they had the exact same UUID available. Now, this is a UUID that's embedded in an Apple iBeacon manufacturer specific data. So if we go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, we can see that they look the same. Now, the thing about names in Bluetooth low energy is that sometimes the name will be in these advertisement indication packets, advind. So an advertiser will just be spewing out these advind packets at certain frequency. And so a completely passive scanner can find some information in there. And sometimes that information will include the device name. But other times you have to actually explicitly request it. You send a scan request packet and you get a scan response packet. So in this case, you can see that this KFTC actually came from a scan response according to querying my own little database. So that means, for instance, if you're just rolling by really quickly and the thing gets out of range, you might send a scan request, but you never may never actually get the scan response back. So that's why it's very interesting that this advind includes this iBeacon data that basically exactly tells us that if you ever see exactly this string, then it is, def or it's a byte string to be clear, this byte string indicates that this is probably a KFTC bank pass. I mean, it's possible that someone else came up with this same 128-bit value, but unlikely. 
The mini takeaway from that, of course, being that parsing those eye beacons, which are very ubiquitous, and extracting these UUID 128s could be useful for identifying unnamed devices, but you may now actually know their name from some other instance where you scanned and successfully captured a name from a device. Now on to Busan, South Korea, where they have something called Gamchang Cultural Village. And so I mentioned before how during the Korean War, all the refugees fled to Busan. Well, the Gamchang Culture Village is essentially what used to be a giant slum where people had their houses on the hill and nobody liked it, it was undesirable. And so they just prettied it up and brightened it up and turned it into sort of a living art park of some sort and basically made it a tourist destination. So that's always a good thing to do with your former slums. So as we were running around there and we walked all the way down the hill, down to the bottom, I noticed some data here that caught my eye because of the fact that it had KR in its name. And then it also said it was a Dyson device. And I think of Dyson as making vacuum cleaners, so I didn't know why they would have Bluetooth in a vacuum cleaner. But then I thought to myself, well, it could be that brand new spiffy headphone slash air purifier that Dyson came out with just a little bit too late to be useful during the pandemic. So I decided to look into that a little bit. Well, Googling around for things that matched that particular name came up with this YouTube video that looked very similar and had a UK rather than a KR inside the name. And indeed, this gave me a nice little pattern that I could see throughout the rest of my data. You could either have US or KR, or apparently at some point I caught one in the EU during my European travels. Or perhaps this is someone from the EU who moved to the US. I don't know, I didn't try to go geolocate it. Another place I stopped in Korea was Daejeon, where I went to KAIST, the Korean Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, to visit one of my former professors. One of the things in that data that popped out to me was this thing called IVT. And then when I looked into it, I couldn't really quite figure out what it was. So I'm looking at it and I can see, okay, it's public, whatever it is, it's trackable. I can also see that it advertises a transmit power of 8 dB, which is relatively powerful. That'll give you a decent amount of range. And then the only other information I had was that it has an OUI of BNCOM. So I look up BNCOM, what do they do? Well, they are a company that sells Bluetooth modules. So looking at the BNCOM Bluetooth modules, I then went and looked at every other device that had BNCOM, just in case there were maybe some similar patterns or something I could pull out. I did come up with these other devices called BCM LN300s, and those looked very similar to these modules they sold called BCM LN100 and 200, but literally on their product page, they have no product called BCM LN300. So Based on these ones, I can see that that's an NRF one, whereas this one, this other module with a different naming convention is uh, CSR, Cambridge Silicon Radio, and this is also NRF. So we might imagine that this BCM LN300 is also an NRF device, but we don't have to imagine that's what the FCC database is for. So things that transmit over radio waves have to be certified for use in America by the FCC, and they also have to send in information about what their modules look like. So we've got this little module, which we can enhance, and then we can enhance once more. There we go. Look at that. That's the magic of modern technology. No, I just basically, yeah, I mean, this looked to me like it was probably N52805. So I just took a picture of 805. Sorry to burst your bubble. Anyways, the mini takeaway from that is that those internal photos pictures can be used to identify chips in some cases. And which chip a device is using is one of the things I want to know. But alas, as of yet, I do not know what that IVT device is. Maybe if some students from KAIST eventually see this talk, hint, hint, they should go run around the campus and dig into it more deeply. Because it's definitely always the case with Bluetooth that it's easier to tell what a device is when you have it physically in front of you. You can literally just walk up to it with a Bluetooth scanner and watch the transmit power increase, and then you have a pretty good idea that that is the correct device. So that's the end of our location-based anecdotes, and I want to once again bring back these takeaways. As a reminder, Bluetooth sniffing goals are different from Wi-Fi goals, right? You've now seen different ways that I can run around, see different devices that are either moving or not moving, trackable, not trackable, and usually trackable. Oftentimes have weird names, but a lot of the times the names come back to what particular device it is, as opposed to someone's home Wi-Fi access point, which may or may not track back to what particular device it is. 
But I've also now shown you some examples where we start to learn things about the Bluetooth firmware, the Bluetooth chip that it's running. So for instance, now we might know, okay, if there's a bug in Nordic devices, well then maybe that affects the vending machines in the Palms Casino. Or if there's a bug in expressive devices, maybe those affect the kick-going scooters throughout Seoul. However, knowing which chip it runs is only the first step to knowing whether or not it's affected. There's further tests that would have to be done. You've also now seen some examples of devices that are advertising names where it's not exactly clear what it is, like that last IVT. And so I'm looking at you, SVE, 5, CLAG, blah, blah, blah. Someone out there knows what it is. Someone out there probably has one of these and can just look at it and say, oh yeah, I know that, what this is. That's why we need to start getting databases or wikis or something put together so we can compile this kind of knowledge about what devices are out there. Let's transition from location-specific anecdotes to device-specific anecdotes. So let's start with Teslas. Well, they have random static BD adders, and I have a Model 3, and it has never changed in the entire life of the device. So that means it's pretty trackable. Even if they randomize the BD adder, it still has a static name. Now, the name looks like, you know, it might be random, whatever, but in reality, it's not random. It's actually the internal portion between the S and the C is part of the SHA hash of the VIN number. So that means you could actually take this and work backwards to figure out what the VIN number is by just computing, pre-computing all possible VIN numbers, creating a lookup database, and then you can know what the VIN number of this car is. And indeed, that was actually done by Martin Herford in his presentation here. So he released an app called Tesla Radar that allows for crowdsource tracking of Tesla devices, but I think you should use Wiggle instead because Wiggle is more generic and has more utility. That's just a single vendor specific thing and Wiggle's useful for everything. And in reality, Teslas have actually been hacked by Bluetooth recently. So this past uh, Kansek West Pwn to Own, the Synactive team actually compromised a Tesla Model 3 through the Bluetooth. Actually, Keen Lab did the same thing against 2017 model Lexuses back in 2020. So as James M. Barre, the father of the Cylon, said, all of this has happened before and all of this will happen again. Transitioning to Rivian. So in general, in this section, I'm going to be giving you regexes that can be used in MySQL or Python in order to find correspondences between particular devices, particular models, and what they actually correlate to. I'll be releasing a database of these sort of correspondences later, but in the meantime, I figured I should just get some of them out in this presentation to start with. So yeah, Rivians. What do they look like? Well, they are also public. And although B, uh, BTmon didn't actually have this OUI in its database, probably I was just running some old version and old Linux, this is actually a Texas Instruments public thing. And if you go look at the FCC database, this is the perfect example. Mwah! Chef kiss! This is what I want to see in the FCC database. Exact details of which chip it's using. It's using a TICC2642 chip. Texas Instruments indicated by the public OUI and FCC database confirming that. If you're interested, here are some other names you can find amongst the car world in Bluetooth stuff. Feel free to look at it later. What about surveillance cameras, the ubiquitous Nest Cams? Now, sometimes they just identify as Nest Cam, but other times they have these names like N and then A to Z, 0 to 9, and four of them. So first of all, they have random BD adders that are resolvable. So finally, we have something that's theoretically not trackable except, of course, it has this static name. So if you move houses and you take your Nest Cams with you, the Wiggle database might show where you've moved to. So these names, as I said, have this, regex have this particular pattern, but that pattern is kind of too generic. So, you know, we, we might infer based on that, like these, you know, maybe it's an incrementing number, and so N0037 is like the 37th one ever sold. And so we might ask, like, where is nest number one? Let's go look in the Wiggle database to find nest number one. Well, from the Wiggle data, if we look for N0001, we can see that nest number one lives in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. Great, Minnesota, that's where I'm from. Oh wait, or maybe it's in Japan, or maybe it's in England. Well, the problem is that the Wiggle data right now doesn't tell us what this N001, is that actually a Nest Cam or is that just some other random device? And that's where having this 16-bit UUID would have been helpful. So this is FEAF and that corresponds to Nest Labs. 
So with that 16-bit UUID, you can say, okay, this device is definitely a Nest device. And without it, you just have to go based on the name and this name can lead to false positives. So the mini takeaway from that is that those 16-bit service UUIDs are useful that are advertised on the device. They're useful for associating products with vendors and to differentiate between different products with similar names. So to help improve situation for the future, I did file some tickets with the Wiggle folks to ask them to start collecting this out of advertisements, and they've been dutifully investigating it. Flippers. Oh yeah, remember those? I said I saw them at Harbor.io in the Netherlands. So I'm not entirely sure why these things are beaconing all the time. Maybe they're just trying to do it when they're trying to find other flippers. I don't know. I don't have one of these. The reason I don't have one of these is because when I looked at their specs, it says that its transmit power is zero dBm. So that is extremely low. That's not going to be useful to me. Using the official Bluetooth range estimator, if we have transmit power of zero dBm, if we're inside of an office, for instance, that's about 15 to 21 meters of range in which you can see one of these things. So anyways, that's just, you know, even if I could create some sort of hacking tool and put it on there, they are physically limited by the actual chip on the device. They're not going to be useful for uh, Bluetooth hacking anytime in the future. Not until they change the hardware anyways. Or perhaps I should say not unless you want to really snuggle up with your target. So anyways, the regex on flippers is just it starts with flipper and then it has a randomized name. So have you seen it? Now you have. These are some examples of flippers that I saw at Hardware.io and previous stuff. This doesn't include all the various dozens of flippers I saw at the recent DEF CON and Ring Zero. But for instance, I was looking through all of these and then I was just putting them into Wiggle one at a time. And this one popped out, this flipper Ironiu. Well, it turned out Wiggle had seen that particular thing that I saw at Hardware.io outside of a Panera bread in Peachtree Corners, Georgia, which is just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. So I saw it at Hardware.io 2022. That particular data point is not in the Wiggle data, uh, probably because I didn't have a GPS lock inside of the hotel. But what this kind of tells me is someone that I saw at a hacker conference in the Netherlands Maybe they live somewhere around here. So maybe this is a way to backtrack all those hackers that show up at hacker conferences with their little flippers doing all their cool stuff and then accidentally giving away where they live. Anyways, like I mentioned, the BD adder is public on these and the name is also non-randomized. So Googling around, you can see that there's actually uh, forum posts asking to change the flipper name. And the response is, nope, the name is written into OTP, one-time programmable memory. So it's not possible to change it, but you can change it. You can edit the firmware to read the name from a string instead. So yes, later on in that thread, someone gave an example of change the code here, and then you'll just read some other hard-coded string name. So hard-coded string name is not exactly going to be uh, good for stopping this thing from being tracked over time, unless you're literally reading writing your firmware all the time. Now, another interesting random thing I found while I was searching around about this is I was looking at the OUI and the OUI is not identified as belonging to any particular vendor. But when I Googled for it, I had actually seen this post, which is talking about how it looks like ST Micro on some of their uh, firmware, their example code, they have incorrect code that is breaking. And instead of doing the correct STM OUI of 0080E1, it is putting in and calculating an OUI of 80E126. So that is the OUI used by this. So we might infer that they're using ST Micro Bluetooth chips. And indeed, looking around at more blog posts, we can see someone saying, yes, they are using an ST Micro Bluetooth chip. And this particular post says, oh, yeah, we need to change the Bluetooth MAC address because, well, BD Adder. Bluetooth BD Adder because it is, you know, always hard coded to the same thing. And that's bad. So let's go ahead and change it. Well, but you're just changing it to a new static hard-coded BD adder, and that's going to be just as trackable. So anyways, there's a ticket out right now that says, you know, please make us less trackable. And someone filed that in November 2022. And the last post on that thread was April 2023. And it's still open as of today as I write this. And so until they close it, until they change the BD adders to be randomized, until they change it to not be advertising a hard-coded string all the time, till then, Flipper folks, I see you. Anecdotes from around the home. Allow me to share with you and future generations some of what the households looked like in early 21st century. We had fridges with Bluetooth in them. When I started the sniffing work, I was somewhat surprised by the fact that apparently I was living in a neighborhood with Bluetooth refrigerators. Another thing you might find is Bluetooth toothbrushes. 
like the Smart 5000, but you'd have to be some sort of an idiot to use a Smart 5000 when you could be using a Genius X. Only the best for your teeth and gums. Wait, they should be paying me for doing advertisements. Anyways, sleep number beds. Did you know that these sleep number beds, which allow you to adjust the softness and firmness, actually have Bluetooth on them? They advertise as what basically looks like a normal colon delimited BD adder. And unfortunately, some other devices like Huawei have names that are the exact same thing. So you have to look at the OUI to see that it says select comfort. And then you'll know, yep, this BD adder looking thing is actually somebody's bed. Just think you could hack into somebody's bed and then make it softer and then it would be like their back would hurt in the morning. Hack the planet! And then, I don't know, this is not that interesting, but one time I saw a thing called Uller and I said, what's an Uller? Apparently an Uller is a air conditioner that you run next to your bed that then cools down a uh, sleeping mat that you put on your bed. Interesting. How about Amazon Echoes? We've heard of those, right? Well, Echoes have the following name formats, but what I found was kind of interesting was the fact that the Echo and the Echo Dot are Bluetooth low energy. They have random and resolvable addresses, so theoretically not trackable. Oh, except, of course, based on these, they have, you know, static names. So this Echo Dot 7RT is only going to be in one location until that person moves, and then it'll be in another location. So kind of trackable. And then the Echo Show and Echo Spot are actually Bluetooth Classic rather than BLE. And Bluetooth Classic devices are always trackable because they have hard-coded BD adders that never change. But again, even if they didn't, they have hard-coded names that are semi-randomized to be somewhat unique. Unique names is good for distinction when an owner is trying to figure out which one is theirs, but not so great when it comes to tracking. Changing gears from the house to the business, mobile point of sales devices, MPOS devices like Square Reader. And the Square Reader has what looks like a sequentially increasing number as part of its name. So the address is public, so it's going to be trackable. The OUI is Texas Instruments, even if BTMON didn't have it in its database at the time. So if these are sequentially increasing, that once again begs the question, where in the world is square reader number one? And while I couldn't find square reader number one, I did find square reader number two. And it's the only one in the entire world, so pretty sure Nova Scotia takes the cake for the earliest square reader device still in operation and which has actually been found by the Wigglers. Another MPOS device that I've seen before is the eDynamo and this has a name like so and this right here is not actually part of the BD adder. So these have public BD adders and they have Texas Instruments as their presumed chip inside of them. So starting to get some good level of visibility into chips. So it is just like any other thing, just kind of be going to be something you swipe through a credit card or put in a chip and pin thing at the top, and then it com communicates back to like a mobile phone for a vendor. At this point, I'll just cite that there was a recent talk at Black Hat from some Argentinian researchers talking about uh, investigating some MPOS devices uh, down in Argentina. When I looked into the names that they showed in one example in Wiggle, I primarily saw that in South America, which is kind of what you'd expect. Now, here's one of the anecdotes from sniffing in San Jose, California, that I kind of wanted to save till later. So, hotels. Hotels can potentially have Bluetooth and they can potentially have Bluetooth in large quantities. And those large quantities might make you suspicious that actually they might have a device per room. Now, sometimes the device per room are very obvious things like Chromecasts or LG TVs, but in other cases, it's not so clear what it is. So this location, I saw 149 instances of things called a TG node and then something that looked like a BD adder. But in reality, that was not the BD adder that it was actually advertising because they had a random static BD adder not equal to that. So that kind of makes me think maybe this is the original non-random BD adder uh, that actually shipped with the device. Because when you look up that first part as an OUI, it happens to correspond to Wistron. And Wistron is another one of these Bluetooth module makers. So then the question becomes, are these advertisements coming from the Hyatt or the Hilton? So it actually turns out that both Hyatt and Hilton have Bluetooth capabilities at some of their hotels. So for instance, this Hyatt website says, Hyatt standard digital key utilizes Bluetooth technology. And then it goes on to mention that you can store it in your Apple wallet. Hilton also has digital keys and you can see through YouTube videos and stuff like that, 
that it's, you know, showing you you need to turn on Bluetooth. And so as with Hyatt, basically Hilton treats it as a thing that can provide someone with a more convenient experience where they can just bypass the front desk, receive a push notification to their Hilton app, and then they can just go directly to their room when they arrive at their hotel. So pre-pandemic, that was convenience. During pandemic, that was basically sanitization because someone didn't have to interact with the staff or anything like that. So at this point, I don't know still which exact hotel hotel that was and I would have to physically go there to find out. Moving on, during my cross-country pandemic cannonball run, there was another hotel that I did see that seemed to have a bunch of devices that were enough that there were probably one per room. Now, at the time I looked at this, it's just a sort of random looking number, just eight digits and eight digits. And there was no real association between any of these digits and like the BD adders or room numbers or anything like that. Now, the door itself physically looked like this. And, you know, this is just some door I found on the FCC website and decided, yeah, that looks about right. And specifically that it mentions using Bluetooth Smart, which was the earlier name for Bluetooth Low Energy. So it's saying that this door, beyond using contactless RFID type stuff, it can also use Bluetooth to open the door. Now, when we look at the OUI on this, it comes up as GE Security. So that seems about right because we're talking about door locks. So it makes sense that there would be a security company. And then furthermore, it also is advertising a 16-bit UUI that came up as UTC Fire and Security. So that might be a little more specific of the company or the company UTC may have been bought by GE Security, don't know for sure. But then at this point, what we can do is search Wiggle with a regex searching for just this OUI and see where else we see it. So we see it all over the country. Drilling down on some random location, I picked I didn't actually pick it. I just literally zoomed in wherever and came up with Charlotte, North Carolina. So drilling into the individual hotel level, we can see that this Hilton Charlotte Airport uh, has a bunch of devices that are being advertised with this particular OUI, and they have a similar uh, naming convention, just eight digits, period, eight digits, similar to what we saw at the Country Inn and Suites in West Virginia. So this gives us a pretty good indication that Hilton is using this same sort of technology. And then we just move a little bit to the side, and there's a different Doubletree by Hilton Hotel Charlotte Airport. Same naming convention, same OUI as GE security things. So indeed, if we just look, if we zoom out a little bit, we can see the Doubletree is here, the Hilton Charlotte Airport is here, the Embassy Suites by Hilton Charlotte is here, and they're all things that are using the same technology, which makes sense. And actually there was like a Hyatt somewhere around here that is not showing up. So anyways, at this point, we know for sure that Hilton is using these sort of Bluetooth devices. Now, actually at Black Hat 2019, there was already a talk about breaking into hotel suites via doing some sort of attack on Bluetooth. They didn't say the exact uh, hotel suites that they were targeting and they said it was in Europe. So maybe it's the same, maybe it's different, but this is just to say that there has already been related work on breaking into Bluetooth based hotel suites. And now at this point, you know, to speak to the somewhat provocative statement that I made in my abstract for the talk, does using Bluetooth locks open the door to assassinations in hotels? I want to tell you where I'm coming from. So there is this really good write up from 2010 that goes through a there's a YouTube video that goes along with it where they basically analyzed a bunch of security footage from a hotel where a Hamas leader had been assassinated, killed in his hotel. And so the expectation is that this was probably done by Mossad. And so they show, you know, the Mossad people coming in and out. But the interesting thing here is at the time of execution, it says there was an attempt for entry via reprogramming the lock on the door. Now, this particular attempt, they show the logs and stuff like that. And they say that the operation failed. So they're not actually sure whether this succeeded or whether the assassins just actually social engineered their way into the room. I mean, literally you can just knock and if someone opens the door, you can push the door open. But you can see the point is there was an attempt, right? An attempt was made to get into someone's hotel room at and around the time of assassination via what, you know, is just the typical mag stripe reader type thing. So I don't think it's too far of a stretch to say that if these Bluetooth devices are having firmware level vulnerabilities where someone just walks up to it, exploits the door lock and can just open the door, well, then this opens up the opportunity for these types of people who do these types of close action activities uh, to continue to have their way with hotel rooms and the people they're in. So that was the depths of the darkness I'm going to take you to. Now let's lighten it up a little bit and talk about Pokemon Go Plus. 
So there's this Bluetooth device that advertises as Pokemon Go Plus. And all it is is basically a little wristband that you wear. And so you don't have to actually look at your phone whenever you wander around Pokemon uh, Poke Spots, uh, Poke Stops, then it'll buzz and vibrate and you press the button and great, congratulations, you caught some Pokemon. So it's literally like the easy mode version of playing Pokemon Go for those who can't look at their phones and just want to play Pokemon Go anyways. And if we see that in Wiggle, we can see it's all over the world. And, you know, Japan and South Korea as well. Moving on to transportation category, we have scooters. And one thing you'll frequently see are things that are list as Segway IoT. And at this point, I want to say that I believe that this is this type of device, which is used for scooter management, shared scooter management. So, you know, there's all the companies that do uh, app-based shared uh, scooter management. You've got your birds, limes, etc. And this is a thing that Segway actually sells uh, to allow people to take whatever scooters they have and then manage, you know, the lock and unlock process. On the other hand, there's things that advertise as NB Scooter and then four digits like NB Scooter 1173. And I believe that these are probably Ninebot scooter things uh, because a company, Chinese company called Ninebot acquired Segway in 2015. Now, all of these have random static addresses, so they are trackable. Now, I'll say that the Bluetooth world is awash in headphones and speakers, so I'm only going to cover one example and specifically Bose. Now for Bose, the best we can do in terms of a regex is LE dash and then however many characters thereafter. Because semantically, this is going to be LE dash and then whatever someone has actually uh, renamed their thing to. Could be Rock Lobster, could be the chairman, could be Casey Butterball or Hans K, where I've censored this because it was clearly someone's full name. And this doesn't actually exist in Wiggle, so I don't have to worry. Worried you're going to look up Hans K and find their real name, except that there seems to be some other Hans K in Wiggle, which also looks like a real name. So, oh well, whatever. Now, the thing about uh, LE dash star is that that seems a little bit too generic of a pattern. So how do we know that those are really Bose devices? Well, it turns out that almost all of the Bose devices use public addresses and therefore the OUI is set to Bose Corporation. And consequently, you can say, OK, well, if it starts with LE dash and it has an OUI of Bose Corporation, then I'm pretty sure that it's actually a Bose headphones, you know, it could be. See, sometimes they, they start out with some default name, or at least I'm assuming they start out with a default name. That is essentially their model name. So Bose Revolve plus SoundLink, Bose Micro SoundLink. And then when someone chooses to actually rename it, uh, then it'll be LE dash and the renamed name. Also, for whatever reason, there's a whole bunch of uh, Bose devices that advertise as LE reserved ABCD and like a but just a single letter. And now back to the point with this Hans K, it is using a random and resolvable address. So theoretically, it should be non trackable. But because it always is saying LE Hans K and some full human looking name for a German looking person, uh, this is what I meant at the very beginning when I was talking about different types of addresses. And I said random and resolvable is, you know, minimally trackable in principle, but it's possibly trackable using device specific data. This name is an example of device specific data. So the mini takeaway here is that even if a company does the right thing to try to prevent tracking by making the BD adder, adder random and non static, other information can still give it away and make it trackable. Speaking of trackable, in the fitness tracker category, it really seems like all of these are just people trackers because they all are doing things wrong and they all are trackable. So we've got Huawei bands and Huawei watches. These are public and they also take the last three hex nibbles uh, from the BD adder and include that in the name. So Huawei band 3E dash and then something that is unique to this particular device. Um, I should just say that, you know, basically all the Huawei watches and fitness bands, they're always trackable. Basically the same thing with Samsung. So we've got Samsung Gear, Samsung Sport, Samsung Fit, and all of these. They're either random and static or they're public and they're explicitly Samsung. So same thing, Samsung devices, all trackable all the time. And to see an example of like what that means in practice, so this particular Galaxy Watch Active 2 21 FE. So I saw this in Washington, D.C., but the Wiggle data showed it over in Ocean City, Maryland, which is a vacation destination. 
So the mini takeaway here is that if there were some other service like Wiggle, but keeping all of the data points, then this crowdsourced collection would be able to show people moving around with these things like watches. And you'd be able to see, oh, I see that, you know, Senator A seems to commonly go on vacation at location B. Now Fitbits, same deal, trackable, 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 trackable. But the thing that I want to say about Fitbits is more about the use of their vendor-specific 128-bit UUIDs. So there are the 16-bit ones that we've seen before, but there are also 128-bit UUIDs in Bluetooth. So we have UUIDs like this one, which were seen associated with the Versa, Versa 2, Versa Lite, Ionic. Then we have this one, which is the Inspire, the Flex 2. This one, these two, which are associated with the One. This one, which is associated with the Flex. And they're all always advertising these things. And so you can start to see some patterns here. So for instance, these four right here are all the same except for the underlined portion. But they're also different from what's used on these particular models. So for instance, the, I've talked to you before about there's advertisements and there's what's advertised may not include a name. So this device has no name. But we said that it can be advertising information or you can get the name back in a scan request. So even though I don't know the name of this particular device, I can tell based on the 128-bit UUID that it's one of these models. It's a Versa, a Versa 2, a Versa Lite, or an Ionic. It's not one of these models. So the UUID, in some sense, becomes a proxy for a model, or at least a set of mod models. So then there was a simple test I could do where I basically just took BTMon, I read a file, I grepped it for the ending portion of one of those 128-bit values, and I found all of the devices that were associated with that 128-bit value, even though I obviously just chose a subset. And so actually it turned out that like I had gotten these names like as I was building up lists of names that I knew what they were. I knew what an Alta HR was, I knew what a Flex 2 was, Inspire, but these things, Ace 2, Ace 3, Blaze, Charge 2, Charge 3, I had not yet actually associated those uh, as being Fitbits, like I just in my list of stuff I know about stuff I don't, I hadn't done that yet. Now obviously I could have gone to like a list of Fitbit product things, but mostly at the beginning of the research I was just kind of looking at things and if the name seemed interesting I'd Google it and find out what it was. And so the Fitbit names are a little bit generic, like Charge and Flex and Inspire. So the mini takeaway from this is that 128-bit service UUIDs are useful for associating products with vendors, even if they don't have a human-readable name. So even if you don't see a device advertising as an ACE2, you could still know that it could be an ACE2 based on 128-bit value that is advertised all the time and which is collectible even by a completely passive scanner that doesn't have to ask, hey, what is your name? This can also associate, you know, different uh, similarities across product lines and how, you know, one generation of product is similar to or dissimilar to the next generation of products. And that can then give you a sense of, well, is the firmware changing a lot or a little? You know, the, the developers, you know, at least went out of their way to change the UUIDs. That may not necessarily mean that firmware is changing in any meaningful way, but it's telling you certainly the developers did more work than these other products that are all, you know, extremely similar to each other where they didn't even bother to change the UUID. And now I know you're waiting for the other shoe to drop about, but what about Apple? What about Apple watches? Well, Apple does the right thing from a spec perspective. Unlike all the previous ones that I was just showing you, Apple does the right thing from a spec perspective in that they have the random private resolvable address that changes every 15 minutes. But... It turns out that other privacy researchers have found that the information that they're constantly beaconing about uh, continuity or handoff, which are features that allow for information to be shared between iPhones and Macs and including uh, Apple TVs and stuff like that, that can actually leak information that allows devices to be trackable. So I would refer you to those if you're more interested in the current trackability of Apple devices. And I believe there's actually a newer one as well. When it comes to cars, there is an extremely common class of devices that are essentially adapters between this ODB2 diagnostic interface and Bluetooth. So basically people will plug something into this ODB2 port, which historically like uh, auto mechanic would plug in a little reader and it would understand the various codes and stuff like that. Uh, and then they would, you know, know what the, the check engine light or something like that means. Now these days, people plug these things in and then it sends the data directly back to your phone and consequently the phone app can tell you what's up with your car. 
The first one of these that I ever saw back in California was called Fixed, and it was kind of interesting because I just used one of the random Bluetooth scanner apps to attempt to connect to it, and it seemed like it actually successfully connected. Now, the car was off, and so I couldn't see any actual data, so I don't really know whether it had completely no authentication, and I would have been able to see stuff if they started. But yeah, that was kind of uh, interesting to see. But there's a whole bunch of these devices going by a whole bunch of different names. Some of them are, you know, quite possibly white label things where they're just generically called ODB2. And the thing is, because the ODB2 port has direct access to the CAN bus, that would be potentially a concern, right? If someone could break into this device and all of a sudden they could send arbitrary CAN bus messages. We know from car hacking security that, you know, depending on how good the car manufacturer has done, the capability to send arbitrary CAN bus messages could allow for things like unlocking the car or it could allow for actually starting the car if they're a particularly bad manufacturer. But I'm not the first person to think of that. There is past work here from Usenix 2020 where they basically looked at a whole bunch of these ODB2 adapters and saw, you know, what kind of vulnerabilities existed. And indeed, there were a bunch of very simple vulnerabilities in these things. Sticking with the car, just a few more miscellaneous car devices I've seen are things like radar detectors, which are illegal in many countries and apparently two U.S. states. These are things that people put on their dash and it detects whether or not uh, there's a speed trap trying to detect their speed. So it would be interesting if police used, you know, Bluetooth scanners and said, hey, I see that, you know, someone has a radar detector here if they were doing it somewhere that it was illegal. Similar thing, RAD 480, another very common radar detector. But I thought, you know, this, I mentioned it earlier in passing. I thought this was one of the more interesting ones. Tryones, and then it could be dash, it could be hash, it could be colon, it could be carrot. Uh, these Tryones devices are apparently custom LED headlamps for people who want to, you know, make their cars look cool. But they include the full BD adder in the actual name, and they are public devices, so consequently it means that people can be tracked by their headlights. So once we start talking about tracking people's movements via their watches or their cars, whether it's their headlights or their audio entertainment system or anything else, I think we deserve just a few words about threat models and stuff like that. So when I was thinking about cars, there was an obvious analogy between the capacity for authorities to use Bluetooth sniffers to track where cars are, whether cars have been in a given location, potentially for uh, crime scene reconstruction of like who was there and when. Well, they're using technology like automated license plate readers for that. And so it's becoming very common for uh, police departments or even all the way down to HOA level to install license plate readers in locations so they can see who's coming and going from a particular location. So it seems analogous to me that if there were a Bluetooth sniffer in a location, then you would be able to see like, is a device coming continuously at the same time over and over again? And that's the kind of thing that police might be interested in high crime areas. What's actually interesting is one time I was talking with a local county police officer and he actually brought up the fact that he was aware that, you know, Bluetooth sniffing might be a useful thing for awareness for the police. And this was someone who had formerly worked in a forensic capacity. So I haven't seen a lot of uh, public discussion in terms of, you know, tracking Bluetooth devices as a way of forensically placing criminals. First, like I have said before, you can't use something like Wiggle for this purpose because anyone can submit any data to Wiggle and it's not just forensically sound. But you could imagine that if the police started, you know, putting their own Bluetooth sniffers and scanners at particular locations, uh, then they would consider this more forensically sound. But the key thing is that this sort of sniffing cuts both ways. It's not just surveillance by authorities, but it's also surveillance by the public. So surveillance is the recording of activity by a member of the public rather than a person or organization in authority. Wiggle is an example of surveillance. It's when everyone collects information potentially to hold the authorities to account. So speaking of that, let's talk about body-worn cameras. Specifically, we're going to look at a Panasonic camera. It goes by TW370 and then three digits alphanumeric and then five digits numeric. And so, you know, just Googling this and trying to figure out what it is. Well, I found, you know, on eBay that we had things that were advertising TW370 and then they had something like QKA041437. So this is a Panasonic body-worn camera looks something like this. And so this is essentially what we normally think of as a police camera, something that they would wear on their body. 
So I googled this, but I had a pretty good intuition that this probably was going to be some sort of police device because I knew from my GPS that it was at a location. I had driven past that location the same day, and there was a police officer who had stopped someone at a very uncommon location, not somewhere that's even really safe for someone to stop normally. So I knew exactly what was there at that location. It had to be something to do with police, and then googling around found that it's a body cam. Now, these particular body cams turn out to be using public BD adders and associated with Panasonic OUIs. So that means these are going to be trackable. So within my county, I can clearly see that it's, you know, my county specifically, which is actually using these devices uh, because I can see in the wiggle data that they're very geographically uh, tightly focused on my county and not in surrounding counties. I think an interesting question to ask about these sort of body cams is, is it only broadcast if it's recording or is it configurable? So there's oftentimes, you know, a lot of controversy about, you know, if police turn off their body cams at uh, times that are inopportune for not actually capturing, you know, something important that went on. For instance, turning off the camera before some sort of misconduct. So it would be an interesting question of, you know, can you tell whether or not the police have their body cam on or off based on this sort of broadcasting? And I don't know the answer to that right now. My intuition is that it probably is only broadcasting when it's specifically flipped on. Uh, that intuition is based on the fact that I've, you know, driven past the police station and I don't see a whole bunch of these things all the time. I only tend to see them uh, when I see police out and about. And there's another fresh talk on this topic that just came out at this past DEF CON where they're looking specifically at Taser or Axon, which is a company that bought Taser. They make a ton of police equipment, including uh, body cams. And basically this, blue, this uh, DEF CON talk talked more about the particular infrastructure that Axon has and how they have you know, recording devices in the cruisers and things like that, and how they use Bluetooth beacons in order to signal that you know, video recording should commence and be uploaded to evidence and that kind of thing. For what it's worth, I know that I have about 520 devices that are advertising with OUIs that are public OUIs of Taser in my data set. And now we get to medical devices, the things that make you go <sighs> For instance, this Dexcom continuous glucose monitoring system. So these systems are worn on the body, typically such as the arm, and they pair between this device, which reads the glucose measurements and sends it back to a device like a standalone device or to your phone. And by worn on the body, I actually mean they're stabbed into you so they can suck your blood. So anyways, these Dexcom devices have a random static address, so they're trackable, and also they're always advertising in those advind packets that there's a Dexcom device here. So it's saying, hey, we got a glucose monitor here. Hey, diabetic right here. Hey, check it out, diabetic person. Yeah, so that's not exactly great. And if you were ever unclear that the thing named Dexcom was actually a Dexcom glucose monitoring system, well, they handily advertise a UUID 16 that also says it's the Dexcom company. And if we go look down a little further, there's also this manufacturer specific data, which also says it's Dexcom. Now there's raw data here of 3703, and I don't know what that means, but it's kind of interesting that they have so little customized data. Uh, if you look at the other devices, they have similarly only two bytes of data. So I'm kind of curious what that is. But the basic uh, point is going to be for all these medical devices, digging in further is a research project unto itself. Next, we have a insulin pump by Tandem Diabetes Care called the T-Slim X2. Now, I'm guessing that this star 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 611 is that it's going to be the serial number, but I don't actually know. If I had one physically in my possession, then I would be able to tell that pretty quickly. So looking at the FCC database, there's one thing that looks like a chip, and if I squint my eyes real close, I could say maybe it's like PCC2540, and CC2540 looks like a uh, Texas Instruments thing, but they're not usually prefixed by a thing. So I don't really know what that is. That's just a shot in the dark. Now, the reason that you're seeing this insulin pump shown at the same time as this Dexcom is because basically the Dexcom continuously monitors the blood glucose level, and then it sends that monitoring to the T-Slim, and the T-Slim actually has the insulin pump, which then directly injects insulin into the person when they see that the uh, glucose is going too high. 
If you've been around a while, you may recall back in 2011 that there was a black hat talk by a person who himself was a diabetic who hacked his own insulin pump that was using some uh, proprietary wireless protocol at the time. But these days, they're just using things like Bluetooth. And even though it goes without saying, I'm going to say it anyways, if someone can hack an insulin pump and or just send it incorrect readings, you don't have to actually compromise this device. If you can send it incorrect readings and get it to start pumping out insulin, well, then you can go ahead and put that person into a coma as they get too much insulin injected into them. So that's always the threat model when we're talking about insulin products. It's basically if you can send too much insulin, you can put the person in a coma or kill them. Now, this particular device is trackable with a random static address, and it says conveniently that it is tandem diabetes care. Now, we go down further, we can see I actually have some GAT information for this. So, I only recently started collecting GAT information. Usually, when you're looking at devices in the phone applications and you say, like, get additional information about the device, it's actually using GAT. Anyways, it's just a way to get a bunch of information from the device. So, for instance, we can see down here that there's a type of information called device name, which has the exact same device name as it advertises up here. So, basically, then once you can collect get information, it's just a question of figuring out, you know, what is the individual uh, type of field, like device name, appearance, peripheral, preferred connection parameters, and then, you know, figuring out some of those are going to be standard. So these initial ones right here, these are all standardized ones. They have well-defined meanings. But then you can also have non-standard ones. So I'll tell you this one down here, this FDFB. Well, that's actually that 16-bit UUID from before. So this is some custom tandem diabetes care thing. And so I don't know how to talk to it. I could, you know, fiddle around and try to collect information. But that is because this one right here was device information. This is probably a way to get additional information as well. Next up, we have the Abbott type devices. These are, again, continuous glucose monitoring systems. They're the ones that you stab into your body, like so. There's the stabber dealy. Stab into your body to continuously send back data to your phone or separate sensor device about the current blood glucose levels. This particular brand has a convenient little sensor pack that you plug into this thing and then click, click, you stab it into yourself. So convenient. Now, looking at the FCC photos, it looks something like this. If I were to zoom in on that, uh, one of those two chips in there is the Bluetooth chip. Not exactly sure. I think it's probably the smaller one because I think it's probably connected through here to the antenna, but I don't know for sure. Zooming in, we can see that this is a public address, so it's trackable. And then we can also see based on the OUI that it is EM Microelectronic. And I looked that up and they seem to be a silicon manufacturer. Uh, they're sort of on the border between silicon manufacturers and module makers, but I'll categorize them as silicon manufacturer. And that's why I think this smaller little chip is the Bluetooth chip, uh, because they make a really tiny, tiny Bluetooth chip. Again, if there was any ambiguity about the fact that this thing is Abbott, it says down here in the 16-bit UUID, it's an Abbott Diabetes Care device. And again, in the manufacturer-specific data. Here you can see that it is more complicated manufacturer-specific data than we saw before with the Dexcom, for instance. Now, one interesting thing I found while I was Googling around for this Abbott prefix that I could see of, uh, present on all the various devices that I'd seen of this type, I saw this forum post in 2020 by someone on a German forum about uh, diabetes care. And the person said, today my work colleagues asked me if I was diabetic. I asked, how did you get on the train? I assume that's a mistranslation of my Google Translate from this German forum. And the person said, whenever I'm around, an Abbott serial number appears in their Bluetooth scanner. And then they said, well, thank you, Abbott, for outing me. Many colleagues and employers still associate this disease with a lot of negative things. So clearly they had concerns that they would be discriminated against at their workplace because of the fact that their Abbott device was continuously broadcasting, hey, I'm a diabetic, hey, I'm a diabetic, and someone at work picked up on that. And then later on they said, I'm sitting here at my PC, and my Bluetooth scanner is saying Abbott 3MH. This is actually how I initially confirmed that this device was one of these Bluetooth devices. So that's one of the not-so-subtle implications of having medical devices broadcasting to everyone that you've got a medical device on you. So where are my diabetics at? Here we go, all over the USA and Europe as well. Somewhere in Germany is a very unhappy diabetic. 
Now, as an aside, as I was Googling around, looking at all the various Abbott things, there was a mention of this insertable cardiac monitor, which is placed just under the skin. Now, I haven't seen one of these yet, as far as I know, but I wouldn't know for sure until I figured out a name, for instance. But yeah, that looks something like this. So just uh, slice me open, stick that under my skin, and even better, Abbott will design not only to detect arrhythmias in the heart, but also wirelessly transmit data via Bluetooth. So yeah, you know, I don't know, feels like probably an Apple Watch type device is better. But obviously I'm not a doctor and I'm sure there's perfectly good reasons why you would slice someone open and put this in them instead. Now, a miscellaneous thing is that Abbott also has Bluetooth pacemakers. And that definitely makes me go, if that Bluetooth pacemaker becomes compromised, what does that mean for the capacity to kill someone? I don't know. And now we have another insulin pump, or at least I think it's an insulin pump. So there's this Omnipod by Insulet, and it is basically both a continuously, continuous glucose monitoring system and a uh, insulin pump all in one. Now, I'm not 100% sure that the thing broadcasting this AP blah, blah, blah number is actually this device, as opposed to in uh, their architecture, they seem to have a requirement for this extra monitoring device that's not equal to a smartphone. The device still pairs with the uh, Omnipod via Bluetooth, and then this device actually pairs with the phone as well. So it's not exactly clear to me why there needs to be this extra device there. In any case, what we know about it is that it's trackable once again, but it does look like the name only comes through on scan responses, so it's not always continuously advertising this at least. We can also see that it's using NXP semiconductors, that's a silicon maker, that's the chip, and what chip it's running is something I want to know. Looking down here in the manufacturer specific data, we can see it saying specifically it's from the Insulet Corporation, and relatively small and simple uh, manufacturer specific data. So where are my diabetics at this time? Well, it looks like mostly the U.S. There's only a smattering of people in Europe that have it. And my theory is, based on the locations, these are tourist-heavy locations like Athens and Rome. So my theory is that these are probably Americans on vacation. So Abbott may not actually sell these devices in Europe, and consequently, that would be the reason for the different distributions. So here's one more device for monitoring blood glucose levels, but it's a much less dangerous form. So this is the One Touch by LifeScan, and basically the point is that you, you know, prick your finger or give it blood, and then it measures the glucose contents of the blood. Now, it has Bluetooth because it'll either sync that to your phone, or some cases I believe that it can sync that directly to a insulin pump, and consequently the insulin pump gets basically like a periodic update as opposed to a continuous monitoring thing like those others that you wear. So what we know about this is it's a random static trackable address. It's always advertising, but again, it's you know not like it's physically plugged into your body. It says that it has GAD information, but I don't currently have any GAD information. Again, I started collecting GAD information later. It's worth noting that the previous thing that had GAT information did not actually say that it had GAT information. I just asked and it turned out it did. This one, however, it says, yep, you can go ahead and ask me stuff via GAT. It says its appearance is of category window covering. So, you know, again, either I've got something wrong in my parsing of that data or they've got something wrong in their setting of that data. And yes, it says LifeScan down here to tell us who manufactures it. And when I was Googling this, I accidentally put in Omnipod and OneTouch, and I accidentally found this news article from 2012 that says the uh, Insulet announces agreement with LifeScan to integrate their OneTouch blood glucose monitoring technology into the Omnipod. So there you can see that Omnipod is basically like a continuous glucose monitoring uh, meter mixed with an insulin pump. And so FYI, they Omnipod licensed it from this company. So this was one of the first medical devices that I ever found because these things are all over the place. This is the Philips Responix System 1 CPAP. A CPAP is a continuous positive airway pressure device and it treats sleep apnea by providing continuous positive airway pressure. What does that mean? It means that it's blowing air up your nose while you sleep. 
So what we can see about this device is that it's actually advertising both via Bluetooth Classic and via Bluetooth Low Energy. So anytime you've got a BD adder that is available via Classic, that is definitely trackable. And so why not go ahead and call it a public address as well for Bluetooth Low Energy. One other thing is that it actually advertises that it has a serial port. So what kind of interesting things can you find if you connect to the serial port? I don't know, I didn't try. But what I was more interested in when I saw this kind of device is the link between sleep apnea and poverty. Specifically, it's a link that sleep apnea is directly correlated with obesity. So there is a linear correlation between obesity and OSA or sleep apnea from citation one. And there is a link between poverty and obesity from citations two and three. So the question I had was, okay, I can run around and see all of these CPAP devices. Are there going to be more of them in neighborhoods that are poorer or richer? So, you know, poorer neighborhoods should have higher rates of sleep apnea, but they wouldn't necessarily be able to afford these Bluetooth sleep apnea machines. So which do you think it is? Do you think the rich neighborhoods are going to have it? Or do you think the poor neighborhoods are going to have it? Go ahead and vote now on your Votatron. What? They don't have Votatrons? I'm sorry, I thought this was the future. Okay, I guess I'm just going to have to show you. So here is the Washington, D.C. area and the distribution of these particular Philips CPAP machines. Here is an overlay of income averages. I believe this is by zip code, but I actually lost the link for where I got this from. But anyways, zip, let's call it zip code based uh, overlay here. So we can see in the Washington, D.C. area that it is this southeast area that is the poorest, so lowest income. There's also a big blob of poor right here, but that's a location called College Park, so I'm pretty sure it's just the college students pulling it down. So in general, super rich over here in Maryland and Virginia, and very poor over here. There's this county right here, Prince George's County, that is one of the poor counties. So that's the income distribution. Think poor over here and go back to this. Well, it looks like that is not the highest frequency. We've got plenty of things in here in D.C. We've got plenty of things over here in the rich neighborhoods, but not so much over here. So again, income distribution like this, and it looks like it's actually inversely correlated. So poor people cannot afford the fancy Bluetooth sleep apnea machines. Who would have thunk it? But still, I wanted to see. Now let's switch gears to heavy machinery. So CAT. BTNT. These are devices that you'll see associated with heavy equipment. So when I googled around for the CAT BNT, I found this thing. This is the Bluetooth network transceiver. And it says these messages are sent over the CAN data link to the machine control ECM to enable operator identification. So that's already super juicy. It basically means that you've got this box that is the magic gateway between Bluetooth. So something saying, hey, I'm a Bluetooth key. And then it turns it into CAN messages, which again, from car hacking, we know that those are the kind of things that can allow full control of the system. So in this particular case, I knew that this was probably going to be a construction machine because on my pandemic cannonball run from California back to Maryland, passed through Virginia right here, and I knew based on this location that there was road construction there. It's a whole bunch of road construction on this Route 66. And so when I see something called CAT, well, I'm from rural Minnesota. I know that CAT stands for Caterpillar and it's heavy equipment. So I found these sort of documents that were available saying, hey, we've got this transceiver. So what's it transceiving for? Well, it's transceiving for this little key fob, which is the actual Bluetooth device. So then you go Google around, you find some videos about how do you, you know, pair those key fobs with the CAT device. And the video says, introduce the Mac ID key code. And it says, type in this thing. There's this thing called a Mac ID. And when you Google that, you see that 506583 is actually the OUI for Texas Instruments. Great. Now I know that it's using Texas Instruments chips. And indeed, all of the CAT devices that I saw in my data set are all using public uh, TI BD adders. So it's trackable. Oh no, I can track you by your heavy equipment. And those videos also conveniently show that the same BD adder is listed on the back of the key. And they talk about things like how to pair with the device and that the device will then automatically start by recognizing the Bluetooth key when it's available. Furthermore, you don't necessarily need a key fob. You can actually pair with your phone. So they'll have an app and the app can act as a Bluetooth transmitter and then pair with the device and great. Now it can, your phone can act just like a uh, Bluetooth key. 
and the machine will automatically recognize the operator and enable start when the phone is close to the machine. Machine Phone Bluetooth must be enabled. So once again, really confirming that this is a proximity-based Bluetooth thing. But I wanted to be really sure that there wasn't something else that might stop someone from going and taking over the device. So I went and looked for YouTube videos, and here's an example of one. So first of all, you can see right there, ah, there's a physical key, right? So just because you hack it with Bluetooth doesn't mean that you're going to be able to get into the cockpit. So somehow we're going to need to defeat that physical key later on as well. But anyways, you can see that he's putting the Bluetooth fob just there. He clicks over the thing to turn on power. He's going to have the uh, touch screen show up right here. And then he's going to fiddle with it a little bit more. And ultimately, he's going to show, like, look, there was no sort of pin code or anything like that. There's an option for that, but apparently it wasn't necessary in this case. So he presses the thing, and then, boom, you can hear that it turns on. So that just confirms for me that this is purely proximity-based starting of the device. So if you could hack the Bluetooth chip, then you could just go ahead and start the device and drive off with it. If only there weren't that key. So anyways, let's say that, like me, you now wanted to go off and hack this device. What would you do? Well, you go to the FCC website, you look at those internal photos, you get lucky and you find out that, yes, it looks like it has a Texas Instruments 2541 chip, which corresponds to the fact that everything was using Texas Instruments public BD adders. Great. Then you pull up the data sheet for the CC2541, you start looking around that, then you go buy yourself a dev board for the 2541 so that you can play around with that at your leisure. But it's not good enough to just play around with that. You need to get an actual device. And uh, yeah, heavy construction equipment is super expensive, so you're probably not going to buy one of those for over $100,000. So you go looking on eBay to see if someone has one of those transceivers, but there's no hits for Cat BNT. But then you accidentally find this page, and this says that this is Caterpillar uh keys so and they work for loaders and skidders and pavers and tractors and excavators and compactors and dozers and you look down there and it says it's compatible with all of these models and you say to yourself wait what these ebay keys that cost eight dollars nine dollars these things are compatible with basically everything under the sun well, that seems like that's going to help us get in the cockpit. So that's great. So this eBay thing, if we look at it really close next to the FCC image, next to the user manual image, we can see that they really look like they're all cut exactly the same. So it seems like kind of every cat device in the world is using the exact same key. And at this point, I'm sort of feeling a little bit like, wait, why should I bother hacking a Bluetooth enabled device when I can just steal any other non Bluetooth enabled device with a single a key that's available for nine bucks. So let me share you the various memes that are relevant to this predicament. You know, my evil plan, buy a TI development board and use eBay to hack the parts and then find the keys that can steal most cat devices. Find the keys that can steal most cat devices. Or this one. I'll let you read it on your own so I don't have to read it for you. That's enough time. Or, quite frankly, this one. This is how I felt the most. So, it's probably possible to steal expensive construction equipment with the Bluetooth exploit. Them. The security baseline for construction equipment is actually very low, and it's super easy to steal them with cheap universal physical keys. Me? Well, now I'm not hacking it. Yes, indeed, this killed my entire exuberance for wanting to hack and stunt hack a construction equipment. But then I got to take off my black hat and put on my security architect hat and look and think and say, you know what? Actually, this is a net security improvement. If basically everything in the world is stealable with those physical keys, then now the fact that you're forcing an adversary to actually do some sort of Bluetooth attack means that you've really, really, really raised the bar. Because, you know, even if it takes uh, someone just a week to hack it, that week worth of someone's time is going to be hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. And consequently, that is a much more expensive attack than the $9 buy and key off eBay attack. So that's why us security people have to not just always get narrowly focused on like, oh yeah, this is totally cool, I'm going to hack it with Bluetooth, hack it with the packet, ow! And uh, you need to consider the full threat model.
So that's the end of our device-based anecdotes. I went ahead and packed up your takeaways for you to remind you that Bluetooth sniffing goals are different from Wi-Fi goals, and consequently, the sniffing tech is underdeveloped to help with those goals, right? So Wiggle is great. It's awesome that we have all of this data available to us, but it's missing a whole bunch of data that we need to really drill down and, you know, confirm things about which vendor is this or see things about manufacturer-specific data. And again... When there's a Bluetooth firmware bug, no one knows what all it affects. Again, my wife Veronica presented at Black Hat in 2020 saying, here's some vulnerabilities over the air for Texas Instruments and Silicon Labs. Does that vulnerability affect the devices in CAT heavy construction equipment? We don't know. There's a lot of devices out there that have no human readable name, so we don't know what they are, but that's the continuing effort of my upcoming research. And there's a lot of devices that are advertising names, but we don't know what they are. And this is the kind of thing where crowdsourcing can really help us, because if you have physically got one of these, you're probably going to know what it is. So we need to come up with ways to capture this kind of information. So this is my final call to action. Join me, and together we can rule the Bluetooth galaxy. Or, more practically, go collect some information, whether it's Wiggle or with my tools, and share what you find out. As I said, I've been sniffing since 2020, so I've got plenty of data, and I'm happy to share it with other researchers on a share-and-share-alike basis. So go collect some information, share it with me, and I'm happy to share mine as well. Now, if you know some Android development, it would be great if you would work with the Wiggle folks to help improve the Android client uh, so that we can collect more of the kind of information we need to collect for Bluetooth to make it more useful for research. And finally, my web foo is weak, and so if you know stuff about uh, how we might be able to get something like a wiki that allows people to contribute names of devices they know, but that can also plug into the backend database so that we can actually do queries and, you know, capture it in a structured form so it's not just like a wiki and we have to, like, scrape the wiki, if you could help with that, that would be great. I could use that help, and it would improve the state of everything everywhere. So, taking it full circle, what did I want to know going to this research? I wanted to know what Bluetooth chips are inside any given device. And so, I knew that Texas Instruments, Broadcom, and Silicon Labs were used for these devices. Did I know what was used in any given hotel lock? I did not, and I still do not. Like, unless I get lucky, I can only, you know, hope that there's some indication of what chip maker is being used. Why did I want to know it? Because there are now over-the-air wireless firmware exploits found by Armis, found by my wife Veronica, found by the Simu Labs folks, and found by my wife Veronica. So here's the situation, though. I just showed you three vendors for whom there are over-the-air actual, like, arbitrary code execution things. There's plenty of other DOS bugs and stuff like that. There's people who have found a bunch of fuzzable DOS bugs. But there are a ton of silicon vendors. There are more than 20 different vendors. And so, like, we could have, you know, 20 different security researchers, each of which who only specializes ever in one particular vendor. And still, we've got decades of work ahead of us. So, if you're looking to make a name for yourself, I certainly recommend you grab one of these and start uh, taking it apart. So, in conclusion, I started this work knowing that I knew nothing. But what do I now know that I didn't know back then? Well, basic Bluetooth sniffing of the form that I've mostly done over the last three years can sometimes give you information. For instance, when you've got a BD adder that's either classic or BLE public, then it's going to have the OUI. And if that OUI is a silicon maker like Texas Instruments or one of those other silicon makers, that's a pretty good indication of which chip you're using. Additionally, that kind of information about silicon makers can pop up in those 16-bit UUIDs or the BT member company IDs. What I also know is that some of that information is available according to various things in the spec, but it's not actually exposed through things like the Linux BlueZ stack. I could actually see with raw sniffing that some of the information is queried via BlueZ, but then it's never exposed in this HCI log in this log of information that I actually capture and parse. That means I have to go out and collect it myself using customized setups. And the one downside of that is that that's not exactly going to be scalable. We can't do that through every single phone app. And that was where that preview of my upcoming work on tooth printing comes in. So this is basically collecting the kind of information I need from, for instance, in this case, LMP, that's a low-level Bluetooth classic uh, link management protocol. Uh, there are pre-authentication packets you can send to request information, and some of that information is going to tell me, potentially, which silicon vendor is actually used by the device. So what do I now know? Well, when I was looking at the basic Bluetooth sniffing, I now know these are not the data I'm looking for. 
Stay tuned for the upcoming research. So Bluetooth security research is cool, but open security training too is cooler. And that's why that's what I spend most of my time on. We'll have some Bluetooth classes eventually by myself and Veronica and potentially other instructors. But in the meantime, there's all sorts of classes on reverse engineering, vulnerabilities, firmware, system architecture from myself and a whole bunch of other folks who were beneficiaries of Open Security Training 1 and who are now paying it forward by being instructors for OST2. So you should go check it out and take a class or potentially if you've got the chops, maybe you should teach class as well.